طيب أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم ألم نشرح لك صدرك ووضعنا عنك وذرك الذي أنغذ ظهرك ورفعنا لك ذكرك فإن مع العسر يسرى إن مع العسر يسرى فإذا فرغت فانصب وإلى ربك فارقب السلام عليكم ورحمة الله تعالى وبركاته يتجدد لقاءنا بكم حول جائحة كوفيد 19 نلتقيكم اليوم إن شاء الله في المؤتمر العلمي الثاني وعبركم اليوم أرحب بضيوفنا المتحدثين والمشاركين Good morning and welcome everyone Many thanks for making the time to join this event my name is Dr. Abdul Azim Abdullah Ali Ibrahim. I am the program director and organizer of the of this event. The COVID-19 pandemic uh, indeed uh, it's very uh, stressful uh, disease and causing huge stress on the healthcare system and tragically loss of life. Today we hope to give you a better understanding of COVID-19 in relation to pulmonary embolism manifestation, neutropenic sepsis management, and diagnostic imaging in COVID-19 era. And also, we would like to share the rapid exchange of knowledge and practical advice and recommendation from our great speaker today. I would like to many thanks for our fantastic speaker today who are kindly agreed to join us to share their knowledge and experience today. So we have the first session is going to be around 10.30. It's the presenter is going to be uh, Dr. Muntasir Abdul Aziz. And it's going to be around update on pulmonary embolism in COVID-19 era. 11.30, we will be uh, joining by Dr. Ahmed Muhammad Al-Tom Ibrahim, and he will be, he's a hematology registrar in the UK, and he will be, give us update about neutropenic sepsis management. And 12.15, also we will be joining by Dr. Aladdin Ghanawi. He will be giving us update about uh, diagnostic imaging in COVID-19. And also we have the expert panel of the, uh, the consultant who are kindly agreed to join us this morning. The first one will be Dr. Mahir Hamad. He is an uh, acute physician in James Cook University Hospital. And Dr. Zadin Ibrahim, he's an internal medicine physician and infectious disease specialist in Sudan, Mustashfa Sharganil. And also we'll be joining by Dr. Nasreen al Ghasim with the consultant cardiologist Mustashfa Ahmed Ghasim Sudan. And uh, kindly also you have seen Dr. Hindal Zain from yesterday. She's joining us at the moment. So I also, I would like to give a big thanks to the, our uh, colleague, the al, al Zaim al Ashari Medical Stu Student Association for their kindly agreed to step up and to take a part in this webinar, joining us by helping an organization and also they volunteering to help us in the upcoming event. I would like to say to them, thank you very much and we really appreciate it. So just for you update about our uh, session yesterday, it's all the session has been recorded and it will be available on my Facebook and also on Dr. Ahmed Adlan uh, YouTube channel and also in the My Heart Journal. So if anyone missed the session yesterday, so please don't panic, still you can go and watch all the event yesterday. And hopefully we will upload the session for today also later on. Just for your remind, if you would like to ask any question or if you would like to give us any comment, please, you can post your question through the uh, Zoom app. So just you need to go to the chat box arrow and press on that and then the choose host or co-host and type in and send your message direct to the host. So we will be forwarding your message to the panel 
and your question will be answered by the end of the session. Please don't forget to mute your microphone and switch off your webcam. And now I would like to pass the mic to my colleague, Dr. Hind al -Zain, to introduce our first speaker, Dr. Muntasir. Okay, thank you, Dr. Hind. Okay. Good morning, everyone, and welcome again uh, on uh, our second day of the COVID-19 Second Acute Cardiovascular and Internal Medicine Online Conference. We are going to start our first session today with uh, Dr. Montasar Abdelaziz. He's a consultant in respiratory medicine in Thameside General Hospital, UK. He's a senior lecturer in medical school, Manchester University. Dr. Montasar is going to give us an update about the diagnosis and management of pulmonary embolism in the context of COVID-19. Welcome, Dr. Montasar. Thank you. Okay, I'm just okay. preparing your slide, Dr. Montasir. Eva, shall I start? Yes, go ahead. I'm just preparing your slides. Can you see it? Yes, I can see it very well. Okay, thank you very much indeed for giving me this opportunity. I will be just covering the how we diagnose PE just very quickly, and then I will uh, I will touch on uh, the PE in COVID-19 at the end of the lecture. Uh, so, if we start, with, can we go to the next slide, please? Yes. On this slide, you can see the pathway of diagnosis PE, and I think this pathway properly in every hospital. Normally, we divide uh, uh, people according to the clinical pro probability to high, high clinical probability or low and intermediate clinical probability. One of the new changes in the pathway is what they did, they simplify the pathway by combining the low and intermediate clinical probability in one group. And we can call it PE unlikely or pulmonary embolism unlikely. On the other hand, we have the high clinical probability where we call it pulmonary embolism likely. In that arm, what we do, we go straight away to CT pulmonary angiogram. We don't need to do any blood test. And if it is positive, we treat. If it is negative, uh, we, we either we don't, we don't treat or some people say that you might need to pursue the investigation further or think of alternative diagnosis. On the other hand, if it is PE, pulmonary embolism unlikely or PE unlikely, then we do D-dimer. And the reason we do D-dimer because we thought by doing D-dimer, we are going to, we are going to, uh, to reduce the amount and the number of imaging. Uh, I'm, I'm really sorry about the telephone. Um, to reduce the, the amount of imaging, the number of imaging. And so if it is D-dimer positive, we'll go and do CT pulmonary angiogram. If it is D-dimer negative, we don't do any imaging and we, we exclude pulmonary emplacement. So if you come to, if we discuss the clinical probability, now we have simplified, we simplified this into two levels, either pulmonary emplacement unlikely, and here the wealthy score, what you call a modified wealthy score will be less than, equal or less than four, and if it is pulmonary embolism likely, then the wealth score will be greater than four. And they found that when it is pulmonary embolism likely, then the chance of having pulmonary embolism is it could be up to 50% of the patient could end having PE. When it is pulmonary embolism unlikely, then only 12% likely to have pulmonary embolism. We did mention about D-dimer. We mentioned that d dimer when it came, it was thought was it would be very promising. And it thought that this test will reduce the number of patients going for further imaging. Unfortunately, actually, d dimer brought more imaging. And I, I'm just going to mention a small study which was done in I think in, in North America. And in that study, what they did, they had two words. 
One word allows them to use D-dimer freely. The other word is not to use D-dimer at all. And at the end of the study, they found that the number of pulmonary employees detected in both words more or less the same, mortality is more or less the same, missing pulmonary employees more or less the same. The only difference is the word which allowed to use D-dimer, they use more imaging, they use more CT scan. And therefore, people thought well, this is actually D-dimer is a problem rather than a solution. And we, we should think of changing our policy. So they thought either we reduce the number of patients going to have D-dimer, or we increase the normal level of D-dimer safely. So this is the thought how to reduce further imaging. Either you reduce the number of patients which is going to have D-dimer, or you increase the normal level of D-dimer. And whether we can achieve that or not, we'll see. There is something called pulmonary implicit rule out criteria. We call it PERT. And this PERT actually uh, designed by somebody called Klein. And he had like eight criteria, including the age, the pulse, the saturation, the swelling of the leg, whether there is hemoptysis or not and no trauma, and no path history of DVT, and no hormone use. And to rule out PE on the basis of PERT, you have to achieve all eight criteria. So you, you, your age should be less than 50, your pulse should be less than 100, saturation greater than 94, you don't have a swelling of the leg, you don't have hemoptysis, you don't have trauma or surgery, you don't have passes through PE or DVT, and you don't use hormones. So if you look at these criteria, you find them if they are very robust criteria. And, and usually we use it with low clinical probability. So now only low clinical probability. And this is a meta-analysis done by Sin et al. And they, what, what, he, what he did, he collected about 12 studies and pulled the data, to, the data together. And they found that using these criteria, you can exclude PE in 97%. Uh, sorry, Dr. Montasser, sorry and, to interrupt you. Uh, which is like- Yeah, you just got the slide. Sorry, sorry. This one? Yes. Sorry, I, 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 I'm really sorry, okay. I should say okay. next slide. So the, what they did, they found that the, 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 the sensitivity of this criteria in excluding PE is 97%, and you miss PE in 0.3%. Only 44 patients out of more than 13,000, uh, they miss PE. Uh, can we have the next slide? So, pair criteria can be very useful in avoiding imaging and uh, if, if using conjunction with low clinical probability. No, not this slide, not this slide. No? 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 No. Sorry, yes, I'm, I'm starting from the beginning. So the first slide. Ah, uh, yes, this one. Yes, stay. So PERT, PERT uh, criteria can be used to avoid imaging and we to avoid using doing D-dimer. Uh, however, you have to understand the limitation of PERC. One of the limitations of PERC is that they are not very good in evaluating people with pruritic chest pain. Actually, pruritic chest pain was not included in the criteria. And it neither included, uh, oh, no, uh, not this one, the next one. Uh, 
No, no. Before that, the before that. Yeah, I stay in this one. Per, per criteria has got uh, some uh, limitation. One of the limitations that pluritic chest pain is not included in the criteria. And they found actually people with pretty chest pain, when you use per criteria, it's the, the, the chance of missing PE is higher than normal. And therefore, this is one of the limitation of PERC. Also, if the patient is pregnant or recently delivered a baby, then the PERC criteria might not be good. And if the patient on beta blocker, because these people actually were excluded from the studies, because one of the, one of the criteria in PERC is the heart rate. And if you are taking beta blocker, then your heart rate will be modified by the beta blocker. And finally, people with thrombophilia screen and family history of ET, you, you cannot use spare criteria. Can I have the next slide? Next slide. Yes. Now, so we've, we've seen how we can reduce the number of patients which you can have d dimer by using what you call pulmonary rule out criteria or PERC. Now, the question is, can we also increase the normal level of d dimer we use? It has been noticed that d dimer is very high in elderly people compared to young people. And this could be attributed to many factors. For example, one of them is they have got higher fibrinogen concentration. Their kidney function is not as good as in young people. They might have occult malignancy or some chronic inflammatory process or uh, inflammatory disease. And that's why you will have D-dimer above 500 in elderly more likely than in young people. And if you look at this curve, you can, if you look at the black line, you can notice, you can see that D-dimer, can you go to the next, next slide? If you look at this curve, you can look at the, you can look at the, the, the black line where D-dimer is, the, the level of D-dimer increasing with age. At the same time, the specificity of D-dimer is less as we be, people get older. And therefore, you will have an old age, you will have more D dimer, which is unlike or less likely to be a very sensitive test in old age. Can we go to the next slide, please? In this study, you can see that if we use D the dimer, you can find that in the old age, in the patient with eight years old, the gray uh, part of the, of, the, of the bar is actually the number of d dimer but no PE. And the green part is the number of patients with positive d dimer and, and, and positive PE. And you can see, although there is a big number of patients have, have had uh, positive D-dimer, but only a small percentage had pulmonary emplacement. So uh, the specificity of D-dimer is less with old age. If we take the page, the, 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 no, go back, what happened? Sorry. I'm just trying to get Dr. Mahir Hamad with us. Um, sorry, I just... Stay here, yes. Okay. If you look at the, the other one, the patient with age 40, you find that the number, the green part is slightly bigger and the number of PE uh, found with positive t dimer is more. And therefore, uh, d dimer might be good in excluding PE in young age and is not very good in elderly age. Can you go to the next slide? Yes. So there is, so what, no, no, next slide, yeah. 
So this now this slide. Yes, stay in this one. So in this slide, you can see there is somebody called Dorma, and he did a very big retrospective study, and he used what we call age-adjusted D-timer. If your age is above 50, you multiply your age by 10, and that should be your normal D-timer. So if you are 65, your normal D-timer should be 650 rather than 500. If you are 80, your normal D-timer should be 800. And what he did, he used this age-adjusted D-timer in a retrospective analysis of data. And we found that he can increase the number of negative D-dimer from 9% to 20% without having false negative. Now, can we go to the next slide, please? Now, this age-adjusted D-dimer has been evaluated by multi-center prospective nine uh, study in, in, in 19 centers in Belgium, France, Netherlands, and Switzerland. And they included more than 3,000 patients. And they use either Geneva score or Wells score uh, to evaluate the clinical probability. And the end point was to see how many pulmonary employees missed if you use age-adjusted T-dimer. Next slide, please. And they found if you have if you a people above age of 675, they found there is 673 patients. And those who have got no high clinical probability, that means they are pulmonary employees unlikely. They found that they excluded pulmonary employees in 246 using age-adjusted T-dimer. So they, they increased the exclusion of PE by five folds. And they noticed that they, they are not missing PE in a lot of patients. They miss PE pulmonary employees in 0.3%. If you use age adjusted D dimer, which if you compare it, if you use a normal conventional D dimer, they are, they, are, they are missing PE by 0.1%. So you can see from this study, from this trial, that age adjusted D dimer can safely be used to exclude pulmonary employees and without missing significant numbers of pulmonary employees. And age adjusted D timer now included in the guideline of American College of Physicians, also included in the European Society of Cardiology, which is endorsed by the ERS, which is the European Respiratory Society. It has not been included in the American Thoracic Society because they felt that in the different center use different way of assays, and also has not been included in NICE guideline. Having said that, I suspect they will, they will be included. And in actual fact, we are using it in UK. Uh, uh, we are using it in our hospital. And, and I think it is very helpful in reducing a lot of imaging, especially in elderly people. You don't want to subject this to CT pulmonary angiogram unnecessarily, especially the renal function test uh, might not be as good as in young people. The next slide. The next slide also. Sorry, I, I discussed that one. Now, we're coming to CT pulmonary angiogram. Is it doing the job? People thinking whether do we need another test with CT pulmonary angiogram or can we just rely on it alone in excluding pulmonary please? Can I go to the next slide, please? The, what we do is now is multi-detectors, so, uh, CT pulmonary angiogram. And these are very good in even detecting sometimes segmental and subsegmental pulmonary employ. And in the in the BioBet 2 trial, they found that the sensitivity of the CTPA is 83% and the specificity is 96%. Can I have go to the next slide, please? 
However, they noted also the sensitivity or the negative predictive value of CTPA in PE depend on the clinical probability. If you have low clinical probability, then the negative predictive value is 96%. On the other hand, if you take if you have high clinical probability, the negative predictive value of CTPA is 60%. And based on that, they felt that probably CTPA is, we cannot rely on it alone in excluding pulmonary implants in patient with a very high clinical probability. And this recommended that we can, if the patient have a high clinical probability, and at the same time have a negative CTPA, should be you, uh, we should do a VQ scan for ultrasound of the leg before excluding pulmonary please. Having said that, we don't do that in practice. Actually, in our practice now, if the CTPA is negative, then P pulmonary emplism is excluded. So are we doing the right things? Let us see more study. Can we go to the next uh, slide, please? Now, in these are four studies. The first two are prospective studies, but the second two are trials. And the, in the first one, you can see that they, they used pulmonary CTPA plus ultrasound of the leg. And they found that the ultrasound of the leg just detected DVT or in only 0.9% in patient with negative CTPA. So the number of PE missed with negative CTPA is not too big. The same thing, the other study, which is uh, number two, we found that people with negative CTPA were followed for three months. And the, within these three months, they found that pulmonary implants was missed in 1.1%, which is still not a big number. And then we have a Canadian trial where they compare VQ scan plus CTPA. And in this trial, actually, they found that uh, with negative CTPA, uh, pulmonary emplism was missed in 1.5%. And also, there's another European trial, which is the last one in the, in, the, in the slide. And you can see that after three months, they found that they missed PE in only 0.3% in the people who had only CT scans. You compare people with CT scan, again, it's people with CT scan plus ultrasound. So if you take all these studies together, you can say that it is safe to exclude PE on the basis of a negative CTPA. And probably whether we need further testing in a patient with high clinical probability remain controversial, and each individual should be dealt with on individual cases. So uh, you use your own discretion whether you need further tests or not. Can you have the next slide? In actual fact, people think that CTPA is not missing PE. CTPA is over diagnosis pulmonary implacement. And this, is, and this is a very interesting study. It is a retrospective uh, study in a tertiary center uh, what they did, they collected all the people who had a CTPA, and there was 937 cases have CTPA. And initially, pulmonary emplism was diagnosed in 174 patients. Then they got three radiologists, three experienced radiologists, and asked them to re-evaluate all these CTPAs again, and to see whether the diagnosis was right or wrong. And the result was actually very interesting because after they evaluate all these CTPA again, they found that in 45%, 45 patient, which is about 26%, one shift, there was no PE. Originally it was diagnosed to be PE, but they found that there is no PE. They, they, they believe that there was not, the pulmonary replacement was not there in these 45 patients. Can you have the next slide, please? 
So it felt that probably CTPA overdiagnosed PE, and especially this happened if you have got a solicitory, uh, a solitary, very small PE, peripheral PE, diagnosing the CTPA, or if it is segmental or subsegmental PE. So this is very interesting study, and we have to take into consideration sometime are we the overdiagnosing pulmonary embolism or not. Now we we come to again, can we have the next slide? Yes, we, we mentioned a few words about VQ scan. VQ scan used to be the screening test for pulmonary embolism until CTPA came along. And people believe that VQ scan probably is obsolete now. Having said that, it still it has its role. And especially it has its role if the patient has got a low clinical probability with a normal chest X-ray, if the patient is young, and is particularly in females because people worried about the radiation to the breast with CTPA. In pregnancy, also, uh, if you have got contrast allergy, if you have got severe renal failure, then we cannot use contrast. And whether to use it after negative CTPA with a high clinical probability, as we said before, this controversial. The problem with VQ scan, if it is normal, then you can confidently, can we have the next slide? The problem with VQ scan is if it is normal, then we can confidently say that there is no PE. And if it is high VQ scan probability, then we can confidently say that you've got PE. The problem is when we have non-diagnostic tests, when we have low or intermediate VQ scan probability. In these cases, most of the time, the VQ scan is not diagnostic, and we need further tests such as CTPA. And this actually is 70% of the cases. So it is diagnostic only in 30% of the cases. And that's why VQ scan also has got its limitation. And that's why we tend to use CTPA more than VQ scan. Plus also CCPA is easier and, uh, to, to, to diagnose PE rather than, uh, compared to VQ scan. Can I have the next slide, please? Now we're going to talk about COVID-19 and VTE with pul pul pulmonary embolism. From our limited experience with COVID-19, there is no doubt that there is increased prevalence of pulmonary embolism in patients with COVID-19. And COVID-19 is associated with abnormality in coagulation, such as prothrombin time, such as APTT or D timer. And actually, the, when we have abnormality in coagulation in, with, in COVID-19, then the prognosis is very poor. And there is, they believe that there is many predisposing factors why we have PE in people with COVID-19. Could be the, the degree of inflammation, the DIC, disseminated uh, intravascular coagulopathy, the hypoxemia, the immobility. And also, interestingly, people died with COVID-19, they did post-mortem and they found they have got microemploi, which you don't detect them with CTPA and hemorrhage there. So still, we, we, need, we need to learn a lot about COVID-19 and to understand COVID-19 more. Now, can I have the next slide, please? So when do you suspect COVID-19? It is, you should have a very low threshold in suspecting pulmonary embolism in COVID-19, very low threshold. And especially if, the, if you notice there's sudden deterioration in hypoxemia with unexplained decrease in blood pressure and tachycardia. And especially if the inflammatory markers are coming back to normal, and also if the ratio between neutrophil and lymphocyte also coming back to normal. In this patient, then if you notice that there is deterioration in, in their hypoxemia and also the blood pressure and the having tachycardia, you suspect PE. And you suspect have a very, very, very low threshold in suspecting PE in people in intensive care. About one third of these patients follow PE. And you have to remember, 
even if the patient had been on prophylactic low molecular weight heparin, it still can develop pulmonary embolism. So it is a very risk factor, it's a very high risk factor for pulmonary embolism having COVID-19. Can I have the next slide, please? Now, the problem with diagnosis of PE in COVID-19 is doing the test itself. Because if you want to have the patient have a CTPA, precaution has to be taken to avoid infection of the staff, to, go, to, to transfer the patient to the radiology department is a hell of a job. Sometimes the patient might be in intensive care unit and we, uh, 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 attached to a ventilator and it's very difficult to, remo to move him to uh, uh, a CT scan. He might be uh, very unwell, hemodynamically unstable, very difficult to move him to CT scan. And therefore, sometimes you have to treat the patient empirically. And therefore, they recommended to do some sort of risk stratification to decide whether this patient is likely to have a PE or not. And the risk of that is stratification depends on three factors. First of all, location of the patient, whether it is in critical care or in the ward, high dependency ward, because people in critical care are likely to have one million place. Also, this is civility and also the demonstration. I will discuss each of these three factors separately. The location, the severity of the disease, and the D-dimer. If we take the location, people with intensive care are likely, are likely to have PE, about one third of them. And this is study from the Netherlands. And 184 patients all have a standard VT prophylaxis. All of them had prophylaxis. And then they confirmed PE with CTPA and ultrasound in 27% of the patient, or almost one third. And the end of the study is recommended that there is high incidence or prevalence of PE among people in the, uh, with COVID-19. And they recommended actually higher prophylactic dose. Normally we use minoxaparin in 40 milligram once daily or just to find 500 milligram once daily, you lose it twice daily in people with COVID-19. This is their recommendation. Can we have the next slide, please? Now, next slide, please. Can I have the, yes. Now, severity of the disease, how we stratify people according to severity of the disease. If the patient at home, then it's less likely to have a pulmonary in place if the patient is admitted and in the general ward, probably less likely. However, if the patient is severely ill in a high dependency unit with a, on CPAP with high with oxygen, then it's likely to have pulmonary emplacement. And also one of the things we use is sepsis induced coagulopathy score. And this depends on the prothrombin level, platelet count, and something called SOFA. So far, it's what you call a sequential organ failure assessment score. This is used in intensive care to evaluate the status of the organ and whether the organ is, is going to fail or not. It is a scoring system. You can Google it, and it is in the internet. And But the Google here, or the, the sepsis induced score, coagulopathy, I gave it to you here, but it is, you can Google it very easily. And if your sepsis uh, induced coagulopathy score is more than four, equals to four, then you are likely to have severe disease and you are likely to have pulmonary please. Can you have the next slide, please? Now, d -dimer. The traditional teaching of d is it is, when it is negative, it is useful. When it is positive, it is useless because we use d dimer to exclude PE. So we want the normal d dimer If the d dimer is high, we ignore it. We ignore it. However, or, 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 or depending on the clinical, uh, clinical probability, probably we would do a CTPA, but generally we don't believe it is diagnostic for PE. In COVID-19, d dimer should be used differently. 
because it has been thought that uh, it has been felt and it has been found that a high D dimer is associated with, first of all, poor prognosis and likelihood of developing ARDS. And in a study in, in China published in the Lancet, and they found that the, if, you ha if the D dimer is 1500, then the, sense, the, 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 the chance of having DVT is less. But if it is 300, 3000, then the chance of having DVT and PE is high. And they recommended, they, they felt that probably we could use D-dimer to, to, to see what treatment we should give. If the D-dimer is less than 1,000, then PE and DVT are unlikely, and probably this due to inflammation. And you can settle for using standard anticoagulant prophylaxis, like one dose of enoxaparin or deltaparin. However, if the dimer is between 1,000 to 3,000, then you can use intermediate dose prophylaxis where you do use double dose. I'm not separating twice daily or delta parent twice daily. And if it is more than 3,000, then you should suspect pulmonary implacement. You should do, try to do a CTPA. And if you don't have a CTPA, you might want it to start uh, treatment dose of CTPA. Having said that, this is recommendation is not proven, but for the time being, while we're more, trying to understand more about COVID-19, it might be a plausible way, a plausible approach. Can I have the next slide, please? So according to what we said, we, we can risk we can divide the patient into standard risk patient, high risk patient, and likely P or proven or suspected PE. The standard risk patient you will find it will be in a general ward or at home. Uh, in general, in, in, uh, we're talking about the hospital. In general ward, he's not having CPAP, and his sepsis induced coagulopathy, uh, coagulopathy score is less than four and the dimer is than 1,000. And these people probably we just give them conventional prophylaxis. Then the high risk patient, I put here the ward, but usually in HDU in high dependency unit. Usually having CPAP, the sepsis induced coagulopathy scores is more than four and the dimer between 1,000 and 3,000. And finally, the very high one, which is likely to have a PE and you might want to to treat him empirically for PE is a patient who's in intensive care, ventilated, sepsis in the US coagulopathy scores more than four, and D dimer is more than 3,000. Therefore, this is the PTS guidelines. Actually, it is a possible approach. It's still not proven here, but it is a, a, a plausible approach suggested by the British Thoracic Society. So the standard risk patient, which we, we, we found them, which we usually in the ward. Uh, can we go to the next slide, please? This is the British Thoracic Society approach, which is not 100% proven, but it is something, it is plausible and something which is, can be acceptable to you that during these times, till we understand more about this disease. So the people with standard risk patient, the patient who we said that he's in the general ward, his sepsis induces score, uh, coagulopathy score is less than four, he's not in CPAP, and D dimer is less than 1,000. We can just give him a standard prophylaxis, which is enoxaparin, uh, 40 milligram once daily, or deltaparin, 5,000 unit once daily. Now, if you come to the high risk patient, this patient, which we said that could be in high dependency unit, having CPAP and oxygen and uh, sepsis induced uh, coagulopathy score is more than four, and that's the pairing between 1,000 to 3,000. These people, you should give them a higher dose of prophylaxis, double dose of prophylaxis. So, not separating twice daily or Delta parent 500 twice daily. 
And finally, the very, very high risk one, which you, uh, which is suspected to have PE, likely to have PE, with those who are in intensive care, those who are in intensive care, who has, has got sepsis induced coagulopathy score more than four, and on, on a ventilator, of course, and did I with more than 3,000. These people, you try to get the diagnosis of PE, and if you cannot get the diagnosis of PE, it might be justifiable to start them on full treatment until you approve the diagnosis or exclude the diagnosis. So this is a, this approach recommended by the British Thoracic Society, and I think it can be used as a baseline for our practice. And we, you, you, we, we, it is that, it is that, it, as I mentioned, it is, it is not proven. So you have to assess the risk of bleeding, and also you, you, and and. But having said that, it you, you might be, in many cases, you might have to take that empirical decision, and you can use these guidelines as a baseline. So can we have the next slide, please? So to, we reach the end now of, this, of the lecture. We summarize the lecture now. So before the imaging, you will have to assess the clinical probability. And the clinical probability recently has been simplified to two group, pulmonary implants likely and pulmonary implants unlikely. And we mentioned that D-dimer is a very useful test to try to avoid imaging, but led to more imaging rather than reducing the imaging. And therefore, we try to reduce the number of patients requiring D-dimer by using PERC, and which is uh, pulmonary police rule out criteria. And, but you have to understand the limitation of these criteria. And then age-adjusted D-dimer is also a very useful way of reducing imaging. And by age-adjusted D-dimer, people are above 50, you would multiply the age by 10, and you can use that to exclude pulmonary implants without doing imaging. Can you have the next slide, please? When we come to imaging, we can say that multi-detector CTPA is safe and to exclude pulmonary implants as the sole imaging. And probably we don't need further testing. Having said that, people with high clinical probability and negative CTPA, whether we need testing, further testing or not, this is controversial. And each, in the, each case should be dealt with individually, and you should use your own discretion. VQ scan still has got its uses, and it, is, it can be used in certain situations, especially if the patient has poor renal function or has got contrast. Uh, contrast allergy, and especially in young women with normal chest X-ray, where you wanted to avoid radi more rad radiation to the breast. Uh, and can we have the last slide? And then COVID-19, there is no doubt that there is increased prevalence of pulmonary replacement DVT in patients with COVID-19, especially those with intensive care. And also, you have to remember prophylactic anticoagulant does not prevent these people from developing pulmonary implants. And because sometimes it is very difficult to validate or to make that, to do the CTPA in this patient, uh, because the patient might be unstable, you might need some time to uh, start this patient empirically on anticoagulant. And it's better to have some sort of risk stratification depending on the location of the patient, the severity of the disease, and the level of D-dimer. And the, the recommendation is to try to consider intermediate dose of low molecular weight heparin in high-risk patients. So people who are very ill, rather than give them one dose of phenoxaparin and one dose of deltaparin, give them two doses of phenoxaparin or two doses of deltaparin. And finally, consider therapeutic uh, treatment in proven or suspected pulmonary implism and keep a high, low threshold for suspecting pulmonary implism. Can I have the next slide, which is the final, to say thank you for having me in this conference. I finish now.
Thank you very much, Dr. Uh, Montasir Abdelaziz. That it was an uh, excellent talk. Uh, Dr. Hint, would you like to take over? Thank you very much, Dr. Uh, Montasir, for this uh, presentation. Uh, I just have a, a question with regard to D-dimer in pregnancy. Do you think that we should not um, request a, a D-dimer test for uh, pregnant ladies? Should we just um, uh, uh, with yes. clinical judgment uh, and the calm? Yes, uh, the diamond pregnancy is, is uh, what you, uh, it, it is likely to be positive mm -hmm. and the recommendation so far mm -hmm. uh, not to use the diamond with pregnancy. Uh, having said that, uh, there mm -hmm. is some attempt to try to uh, get a D dimer level for pregnant lady still haven't been validated. And I think if this been, uh, come to be successful, it would be very helpful because it will help to avoid uh, mm -hmm. uh, imaging into, uh, to, to, this, uh, to, to pregnant ladies and to avoid radiation. Uh, but I think the recommendation not to use them, not to use mm -hmm. them in, in, in pregnant lady. And we, we don't use them. I have myself in my own practice, I used it in pregnant ladies, hoping that it will come to be negative and then I do, do, do I don't, and then I don't do the imaging. But in all cases, I did the time I came to be positive and I had to do the imaging. So I think it is a competition not to use them. Right. Thank, Thank you. you very much for that. I think we got Dr. Question. Mahir Hamad. Dr. Mahir, can you hear me? Yes, I could hear you. Yeah, fine. Thank you. Yeah. Carry on hand, sorry. Yeah, just another question. Now, for patients who are uh, like low or uh, intermediate and they're stable, we use the new oral uh, anticoagulant or the DOAC. So, uh, what's your um, opinion yes. about that? The recommendation so actually, the, uh, the, this PTS uh, statement actually came recently as the recommendation to use low molecular weight. Now, I think while the patient inpatient, I think he should have low molecular weight heparin. When, when he get out of the disease, of the severity of the disease, I think probably it might be plausible or to use the uh, NAWAC with his oral medications. But while in hospital and while he's severely ill, I think we should stick to low molecular weight heparin. Thank you very much. And this is a recommendation from the British Thoracic Society statement. Uh, I think there is a question from the audience here. Uh, the question uh, said that, uh, do you think that COVID-19, uh, according to you, what you've explained, is um, increasing the risk of uh, patient, increasing the, the score of the patient, and um, the patient will be at high risk for pulmonary embolism? That's the question. Yeah, I I, yes, answer. of course. Yeah, it does. It does. It, it does increase the risk of the score, of the score, and and that why they, 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 they came with this risk stratification. Yeah, you will you will find yourself most of people who admit it. You might want it to use double dose of anoxaparin or delta parin, uh, or sometime you use a therapeutic dose of delta parin or delta parin if the scoring is well, if, the, if, if we feel that it's very high, especially if the patient is in intensive care. So I think still the guideline is not solid and it is not clear cut. And that's why you have to use your own discretion and response of the patient to treatment. And also you have to take the patient, every patient individually. For example, you look at the x-ray, you look how bad the chest x-ray, and whether the degree of the hypoxemia can be explained by the finding in the chest x-ray, and, and, and whether the inflammatory marker is high or not. So it, if, if each patient is to you be used in an individ, uh, in individual basis. Having said that, this yeah, this uh, strat uh, strat uh, criteria to stratify the patient into groups is just a rough guide. And it, 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 there is no doubt COVID-19 improves the, uh, the, the scoring, of, especially if it is severe. 
having said that, many people with COVID-19 actually, they, they, they can be asymptomatic. They can be just at home. So it depends, it is unpredictable disease. It depends on your luck. Some people get it severe, some people get it very mild. And still we, we need to understand more about the disease and why people, some people just get it very mild and why some people get it very badly. And so it is a lot to learn from it. Thank yeah. Okay, thank you. I think we've got Dr. Nasreen al -Ghassan. Dr. Nasreen, can you hear me? Uh, yes, I can hear you. Okay, do you have any comment or any question to Dr. Muntasir? Uh, so far, no question. Thank you for the elegant presentation and uh, the overwhelming uh, of everything. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you very much. Yeah. And I think we've got Dr. Maher. Dr. Maher, do you, would you like to add anything? I think, I, I, first of all, I need to thank Muntasir for his... Uh, comprehensive lecture and he came with a lot of points which we need to uh, uh, really we need to take, uh, take care of really but uh, I guess I want to add two or three things to what he said and then I'll ask a question. First of all uh, uh, in COVID-19 any sepsis could cause VTE if Montas agrees with me. All sepsis is, people with sepsis have increased incidence of P, P, uh, thrombombolic disease. Uh, the problem also with COVID-19 also, they do, uh, people, uh, patients develop the, the IC as well, which is, so it is a very fine uh, balance between anticoagulation and uh, people who had uh, also uh, have the IC. This, this, so we need to stick to basics. First of all, like what he said, Montosa said, age-adjusted D dimer is very important, very crucial here. The other thing is uh, weight-adjusted thromboprophylaxis is very important because we don't stick to that. And we knew people with uh, high BMI have poor, poor prognosis in... Uh, Poor prognosis if they uh, if, if, if they got uh, COVID nineteen, and the third and important thing, uh, third and important thing that prolonged prophylaxis because we knew people could develop uh, VTE or thrombombolic disease after they go home, and it is up to ninety days, which we say hospital acquired VTE. So we should have even when we discharge the patient. That's not the end of the story. They should have uh, thromboprophylaxis, uh, prolonged, prolonged, prolonged pro thromboprophylaxis when they go home. Uh, so uh, the, 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 and I, I think, uh, like what Montas have said, uh, we should have a very low, low threshold in arranging CTPA and think about it. Uh, about uh, uh, thrombombolic disease. I have one patient, few patients who after they went home, they did, they failed to improve, they did not improve. I think they, they have the initial improvement and they were discharged home. They were, they were not, the people with the lowest group, uh, if we follow Montasir uh, classifications. And they went home and they still struggled. And then we, when we brought them back and we did the CTP, we found that had, had uh, they had uh, thrombombolic disease. So keep all, always keep thrombombolic disease and PE in, your, in the back of your mind, please. What do you think Montasa to that about? No, I think I agree with you, all, all your point you mentioned. And, and sometimes actually, as you mentioned also, anticoagulation might be very tricky if you have DIC or decimated intravascular controversy. And I think you might need the help of a hematologist also. So I think it can be sometimes very tricky. It is not that as easy. I, it is very easy to mention it in the lecture and mention many, many recommendations. I agree with all what you said. And also, I think that the prophylaxis even at home after being discharged, if you, are, if you come to hospital and you have prophylaxis at home also is good uh, for, for, for a while at least, till you become more fully mobile. Yes, yeah. Okay. Thank you. And I think I got uh, two questions from the uh, delegate. I think one of them is already Dr. Maher might be just uh, touched briefly. The first question, I think, with regard 
Uh, do you think the COVID-19 increased the risk of uh, pulmonary embolism? And I do. I think Dr. Mahir already touched this. And the second question, if a patient already on low molecular weight heparin uh, develop further pulmonary embolism, and what, what would you recommend in this situation? What, what, the question? The second question, if the patient on low molecular weight heparin and develop, and I think I will make it like, if the patient already on anticoagulation and he develop mm -hmm. further pulmonary embolism. Yes, okay. Now, the first question, yeah, there is no doubt it is, uh, it's increased the risk of pulmonary embolism and Mahir mentioned that, uh, I'll probably answer that question. Now, this is the question whether the patient is already have an anticoagulation and develop further pulmonary embolism. If it is, I, 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 I guess he meant, if the patient has therapeutic dose of anticoagulation, yes, I and think then so. despite that, he develop another pulmonary embolism. And now this is this is this is this is a dilemma not only in COVID nineteen it's, a, it's a, a dilemma in normal in other people who are not don't have don't have COVID nineteen, and one of the way of using it they can use a high level of anticoagulation. You can switch to usually when we give warfarin we give warfarin to higher dose, and like for example when you have a PE we the INR is two to 2.5. If you have uh, a pulmonary embolism, despite having uh, being anticoagulated, uh, anticoagulated, then we we might ask for INR of more than three, a three or more. So it is it is it is something which is very difficult to, to deal with. One of the other things to do sometime it will be these people, we keep them on anticoagulation. We do an ultrasound of the leg. If there is a big TV there, we might do an inferior vena cava filter with the anticoagulation. So it is something uh, which you, it's the dilemma actually. It's a very difficult to manage this patient, even in patient with, without COVID-19. And also these people also, you have to, to evaluate whether they are, whether they develop another PE, whether they are hemodynamically stable or unstable. If they are hemodynamic and stable, whether we consider therapeutic therapy or not. So it, it is something difficult to manage, and you might need also the help of the hematologist with you. Okay. Thank you uh, very much. And um, I think anyone, any more comments or any question? Dr. Nasreen, Dr. Hen, Dr. Mahir? No, no, thank you. Uh, Dr. Ahmad, I think we've got Dr. Ahmad Ibrahim and Dr. Aladdin, uh, both of them very ready. Do you have any question or any comment on the first talk? No, I think that's a good and very informative session. Thank you for the comment. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. So uh, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Montasir. That was a really great talk. And um, now I think we move into our uh, next speaker, Dr. Ahmed Muhammad uh, Ibrahim, Ahmed Muhammad, jo, Ahmed Muhammad Tom Ibrahim, who is a hematology clinical fellow in uh, Queen's Hospital in Romford. Dr. Ahmed. Uh, uh, hi, hello everybody. And uh, uh, my name is Ahmed, I'm working in hematology uh, in Queen's Hospital in Romford. Uh, today I'm going to talk about uh, nitrogenic sepsis and before that uh, I would like to thank Dr. Abdelazim for organizing such a well organized and informative conference and also to thank all my colleagues for joining us today uh, and uh, today I'm going to talk about nitrogenic sepsis because it's quite uh, an important topic and it is a medical emergency just the same like a heart attack and a stroke. Uh, can we go to the next slide, please? Uh, yeah, nitrogenic sepsis is an emergency and if it's not treated very well, and it can lead to a very serious consequences. Uh, it is just, as I said, is the same like a heart attack and a stroke. So we have to think about it and uh, we have to treat it uh, uh, very well, all on suspicion and not 
to await to confirm the diagnosis, but it should be treated only on suspicion and uh, to reduce the risk of the consequences and the complication. Uh, and I would like to talk about this because uh, it's quite important. There's some objective for this talk. Uh, we need to, by the end of this session, is to understand what is the intervening exceptions and uh, what is the presentation, how we can recognize it, and how we can treat it very well. Uh, next slide, please. Um, I've got a scenario um, for a patient is a lady, is 55 years old, and uh, she is a known. Uh, I'm sorry to interrupt you, Dr. Ahmed. I think uh, your. Can you hear me, Dr. Ahmed? Dr. Ahmed, can you hear me? Uh, she admitted for uh, elective psychiatry to the yeah. 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 I think we got the problem a little yeah, bit with your. Yes, yes, yeah, okay. Yes, I can yeah, hear go you. Go ahead now. I think they're a little bit from the beginning. Uh, they're a little bit with the you, problem yeah. with the sound. Okay. Yes. Go ahead. Okay. Uh, is that clear now? Yes, go ahead. Okay. So it's a case scenario uh, for a five-year-old lady. Uh, she's a known acute myeloid leukemia. Uh, 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 she admitted for uh, elective psychiatry. To chemotherapy, and uh, otherwise, her background she is uh, fit and healthy. And she doesn't have any. Opponent. Sorry, Dr. To Ahmed, can you hear me? Uh, yeah, I think the voice is not clear. The sound is not clear. Ahmed, Dr. Ahmed. Is too, so that is why active lady. Uh, on day 10 of her Dr. chemotherapy, Ahmed. he became a uh, cancer and she is released. Yeah. And I'm really sorry yeah, to interrupt I you. you very well. I'm really sorry to interrupt you. I think we got uh, we are really, really hard to really hard to yes, hear you. Sorry. I think what we're going to do now, I think we will move to Dr. Aladdin Gnawi to give his talk and I will uh, try to contact you. Dr. Aladdin, are you ready to go ahead okay. and put your slides? Okay. Yeah, yes, I can go ahead. I hope you can hear me well. Yes, we can hear you and we can see you. Thank you. Excellent. I will just take this slide off and then you can share your slides. Okay. Okay, go ahead, Dr. Aladdin. Okay, um, sorry, but I'm getting a message that's saying you cannot start share screen while so, others... So, okay, sorry, I will get my slide, sorry, from you, and then you can. Okay. You want to try now, Dr. Aladdin? Can you see my slides? Uh, I'm afraid you can't see all the slides. If you've got any difficulty, I can open your slide from my... Uh, I think uh, that's laptop. better. I think that's better if you do that. Okay. Okay, yeah. just give me a second then. While I'm preparing your slide, do you wanna start your talk? Okay. Uh, hello everyone, I'm, uh, my name is Alad Dean. I'm one of the registrars, I work in Nottingham. Thank you very much for inviting me to speak here today. Um, it's a great pleasure. I'm going to talk to you briefly about the role of imaging and the main radiological uh, findings of COVID-19. Uh, first, I would just like to thank 
Dr. Kennedy, Dr. Ayong, and Dr. Patel for putting these slides together and uh, giving me the uh, um, permission to share. Okay. Okay, so I'm just nearly there now. Okay, can you see now, Dr. Aladdin? Yeah, okay. So if we go to next slide, please. So this is my disclosure. Um, go to the next slide, please. So this is what I'm going to try to talk about today. Um, just to give you an idea of how you can utilize the radiology in uh, COVID-19. Briefly touch on reading normal chest radiographs just to help my junior colleagues. And then I'm going to talk about the main findings of COVID-19 in chest X-ray and in CT chest. Next, please. Okay, so in terms of the role of imaging, um, I think the main role is it adds to pretest probability assessment. Um, if you have a patient who's clinically suspected and if you're waiting the swap or if you don't have a swap uh, result, then you can merge this with the radiological findings and that would be very useful. And I'll come more to that. It can also distinguish between severe and non-severe cases. It can help us to look at alternative diagnosis. And also, it can help us to assess deterioration and look for complications. Next, please. This is what we do in my institute. So if you've got a patient who is uh, clinically suspected, um, got typical history, the and the needs of the hospital assessment, you can't, you, they all have chest x-rays. If you have a positive x-ray findings, which the, the, the typical findings, and I'll come and explain the findings, then you should isolate the patient whilst awaiting the uh, swab result. Even if you have a negative swab result, still this should be treated as COVID positive. If the chest x-ray is clear, and um, you still have a very high clinical suspicion, then we move to the next step in imaging, which is CT. Uh, CT is very sensitive, and it can also help us to look at um, alternative you know, differentials or uh, assess complications as well. Thoracic ultrasound, we don't use it in my institute. Uh, I don't think it's widely used, but um, few papers came mainly from China describing the use of thoracic ultrasound in ITU um, portably just to look for um, the, 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 the progressive features uh, of COVID-19. And I stress on portably, so it's not something that we, we will transfer patient to and from radiology department, it's done purely in ITU um, portably. Next, please. Okay, so here's a, just a normal chest radiograph, just a quick reminder of um, how to look at those. Um, it's quite useful to have a simple way of looking at these radiographs. When we, uh, at the start of the epidemic, we've been faced with a huge number of chest radiographs that's all needing urgent reports. So very useful to have a quick um, kind of uh, way to look at those. So I follow the ABCDE approach, very useful approach. I start by the airway. I look centrally at the trachea, make sure it's central, make sure it's not deviated or no kind of mediastinal shift. And B, I look at breathing, mainly I look at the lungs and I compare the zones, I compare both zones, upper zone and both lungs, mid zones and lower zones. And I pay very good attention to the lung apices and to the periphery of the lung laterally. C, I go to circulation. And by this, I just look at the heart. I make sure that I can look at the margins of the heart, make sure there's nothing obscuring the heart margin and nothing really behind the heart. 
D, I mean, look at the hemidiaphragms to make sure that there is no masses around the diaphragms or no nothing obscuring the costophrenic angles, i.e. like no pleural effusion. And then the last thing e is just to look at everything else, look at the margins of the film, look at the bones, make sure no fracture, no bone lesions or anything. Okay, next please. Okay, so we'll look at the main features of COVID in chest radiographs. The predominant finding that's been described is airspace opacities, which are mainly bilateral, peripheral, and most of the time um, affecting the lower zones. This is the predominant findings. You can have obviously variations, it can be patchy, can be unilateral, it can be very subtle, especially in the early phase, phases, um, and I'll show you some examples. One of the other commonly described features is the rapidly changing appearances. I'll also show you some examples. Effusion in pyema or other features of um, bacterial pneumonia have been considered um, atypical. Next, please. I'll start by showing you this uh, example from uh, NUH, from this 84 year old gentleman. Um, typical history, cough and fever, few comorbidities, and his first virus swab was positive. So when you look at the uh, radiograph, um, quite clearly you can see the peripheral opacities within the mid and lower zones, um, more on the right side, but you can still pick up some on the left lower zone as well, peripherally. Um, in this case, this considered typical findings, you do not need to do CT or any further imaging. Next example. Another example is a young patient. Again, first swap was positive. He's a female, typical history, fit and well. If you look at the periphery of the lungs, again, more on the right side, you'll pick up these kind of subtle opacities. Um, you can see some on the left as well, mainly peripherally. Again, no need for CT here, it's typical findings. Next. This is the same patient, uh, only two days later. You can now see if you focus on the right kind of perihalar region. Now there is a perihalar dense consolidation. It's just to show you that um, the rapid changes of appearances on chest radiograph, uh, which is typical for COVID. Next, please. Another example of uh, rapid X-ray changes. Um, here's a patient who had two um, negative swabs initially. On day one, on the on your um, uh, on the right side, you can see that um, there is a very subtle opacity on the right upper lobe, kind of a triangular opacity, um, and if. We look at the same patient only um, eight days later when he clinically deteriorated and went to ICU. You can see that this opacity is now turned into a very dense consolidation. So this is uh, in one week time, which considered um, rapid changes. Okay, next. A few uh, more examples. This is a mild case here. You can pick up the uh, opacities mainly in the right lower zone. Again, peripherally, young patient. Next. Another typical x-ray here, 60 year old, um, right mid zone peripherally and left lower zone opacities. Next. Moderate to severe case, 56 year old, Again, you can see the opacities, uh, mid and lower zone, more on the right side, but quite subtle, again, peripherally, touching the rib cage on the left. Next. Moderate to severe case. Uh, this is uh, the 34-year-old uh, patient. The opacities are again peripheral, but in this example, you can see it's kind of infiltrating, going into the mid zones as well. 
But uh, if you look uh, mainly on the right side of the lung, preferably um, it's, it's uh, kind of more pronounced. Next. 81 severe case. Now the opacities are quite diffuse, uh, which you can see in severe cases. And the next one as well, um, yeah, if you could give me the next slide, please. Is uh, uh, Next slide, please. Another example of a 39-year-old severe case. Now the opacities are quite diffuse. Um, Okay, next. Okay, so moving on to CT. Um, as I said, mainly the use of CT is when you have a very high clinical suspicion with normal chest radiograph and uh, PCR negative, or if you don't have a PCR in hand. If the X-ray is typical, then you don't need to do CT. Um, I know some other centers, they prefer doing CT instead of X-ray initially, but uh, we don't do that here. If you do a CT, obviously, depending on the clinical history, you can either do um, a normal non-contrast CT or you can do a CT pulmonary angiogram. The way we do it in my institute is that we do straight go to CTPA because it will allow us to uh, look at features of COVID and also exclude pulmonary embolism. Um, very high sensitivity, 97%, but it's not specific, 20, only 25%, because you have to uh, put in mind that you have a very wide differentials of viral pneumonia that look can look exactly the same. CT can be negative in early stage. So all the guidelines are against using it as a screening tool. Next, please. Next slide. The main CT findings are, again, they're in, in early disease, you can see the multifocal and again, peripheral, here we, we describe it as ground glass opacifications. And those who are not uh, familiar with the term, ground glass opacifications um, is a radiological terms that means opacity within the lungs that you can see the vessels through it. So it's not as dense as consolidation. Mid disease, kind of day four to seven, the main uh, finding that's been described is, cra is crazy paving pattern. And I'll show you an example of that. Late or recovery phase, day eight to 14, uh, some patients will develop dense consolidation. And then post recovery, we've seen some examples of patient developing uh, some fibrotic changes or traction bronchiectasis within the lungs. So um, some permanent lung damage is, uh, is seen in some cases. Again, like x-rays, effusions in pyema are atypical features. Next, please. Here is an example of um, ground glass opacification. You can see the arrow pointing nicely towards it. Um, opacities not very dense, you can see the vessels through it. Again, in uh, COVID, you can, uh, it's expected to be smooth and peripheral. Next. Here is an example of a patient who was, uh, was ventilated, had initial uh, PCR was negative. Again, here you can see the ground glass opacifications, mainly peripherally. And you can see that it's also an area of dense consolidation within the right side. Next slide, please. This is uh, what we mean by crazy paving. Uh, it just means that you have an area of ground glass 
and through that area you have some interstitial septal thickening which was the uh, arrows pointing towards next this is what we uh, expect to see in the resolution phase um, if you look at the periphery of the lung you can see some organized kind of dense consolidation in the resolution phase and after that, later on, uh, you can expect to see some bronchial changes or some fibrotic changes, as, as, as I mentioned earlier. Next, please. Next. OK, so here is the, my key points, really. Uh, chest x-ray can be very useful, but only in, uh, in the right clinical context. So in the context of clinical probability and lab assessment, what you're looking for is peripheral airspace opacification. And if you see the, uh, those features, even if you have a negative swab, then isolate the patient and treat as COVID. CT has a role as well, uh, especially when the X-ray is normal or indeterminate. And again, you look at the peripheral our multifocal ground glass changes. Um, and it can be again used to check for progression or to assess for complications. Um, as you all know, negative PCR does not exclude COVID-19 in early disease. And this is really when we um, play a role uh, as radiologists. Next. Some useful resources, if anyone uh, wants to, um, you know, to read more about the radiological features, and I'm sure you'll have the slides and you can uh, expand on the topic more. Uh, next, I said uh, thank you very much for listening, and I'll be ready to take any questions if there's any. Yes. Uh, can you hear me? Yes. Yes, we can hear you. I'm sorry, I was just mute and talking on the phone. Thank you very much, Dr. Aladdin. This was really fantastic talk about the summary, how to uh, just approach patients with COVID from imaging point of view. Now, I think I would like to uh, leave the consultant, if they got any comment, Dr. Mahir and Dr. Nasreen, to just go ahead and if they got any question or any comment. Uh, yes, uh, yes, what I did. Sorry, sorry, yeah. No problem. Yeah, no problem. Yeah, go ahead. Go ahead. No, yes, I want to thank. Uh, thank really, really. Go ahead, Doctor Maher. Yes, sir. Yeah, it's a good lecture. Very simple, very simplified, and I think uh, uh, I congratulate you, I congratulate you for, for 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 delivering this lecture. Really, it's very simple, and uh, I think people could like what you said could develop on that. Really, thank you. Pleasure. Thank you. Uh, yes, thank you very much. Uh, the lecture was really uh, informative and simplified. It's much easier for us as non-radiologists. Um, actually, um, the question may be broadened uh, uh, to the panel. Uh, if we are linking these findings, uh, the early findings, and then uh, uh, the uh, evolute, uh, evolving signs uh, in the X-ray or in the CT, uh, with the possible unknown, clear, and definite pathophysiology of uh, what the virus does in the lungs, uh, uh, with the theories of it's um, maybe related to the virus itself causing consolidation, or maybe due to the hypoxia, or maybe to the uh, thromboembolic phenomena. So could this be clearly linked? Is there any approach to link these stages of virus invasion or virus effect with the findings of the CT or chest? Or is it just a matter of probability and the patients and uh, uh, the probability of just getting contacted with someone else. So it's a matter of clinical probability or there is any possible link with the pathophysiology. Did you get me? Yes, so I think yeah. your question, if I got it clearly, is that can we match these stages of findings in radiological, uh, yeah. the radiological findings with the clinical kind of... Uh, yeah. Um, 
I'm not entirely sure, but I've seen we've seen some patients. It obviously depends on the uh, the onset of symptoms. We've seen lots of patients who came on very early on the disease, day one or day two, and we could not pick up any findings on X-rays and on CT as well. Um, later on, if we did another uh, X-ray, day three or day four, then the ch changes would be quite florid. Um, I'm not aware of any papers uh, that linked the changes to the clinical pathophysiology, but I'm quite happy to open the question to the panel to see if anyone has got any other experiences. Oh, thank you. Uh, uh, just can I add something, please? Go ahead, Dr. Mahir. Yeah, I think like what, like what uh, Dr. Aladdin said, it is very difficult, to, uh, very difficult to, to link this to to clinical pathophysiology, but uh, pneumonia is pneumonia. You could see pneumonia. All those changes have been seen in other viral illnesses and other um, bacterial infections. So if you have pneumonia, it's pneumonia. Ground ground appearance, you see them as well in viral and other infections. So the, the pathophysiology, it is it is it's so broad, really. It, it's not it's only it's not characteristically happening in COVID nineteen. It also is happening in other illnesses. Do you agree with me, Aladdin? Or definitely yes. Um, for example, if you look at the CT yeah. findings for the acute presentation, you will be looking at the acute differentials for mm. acute glass changes. And this yeah. is a huge list. Yeah. Including SARS, MERS, any yeah. viral pneumonia or atypical pneumonia. So I think it's, as you said, Dr. Meyer, very difficult to link it. Okay, I'm a, can I comment here? Yeah. yeah. Hello? Montasir, yeah. yeah, can I yes. comment? Can, can, can you hear Montasir? Yes, we can hear you, Dr. Montasir, and we can see you. Just go ahead. Yeah, okay. I think we, we are still learning about this disease. And I think that question is very difficult to answer because to try to explain everything pathophysiologically with this COVID-19. Having said that, if you look at the post-mortem studies, they, they found that at the periphery, at the, at the level of the capillaries, at, there is macrohemoric and macroimply and endothelial damage. And that might explain why we tend to have more peripheral shadows in the CT scan and X-rays rather than centrals, uh, because it, it affects uh, the tissue at the, at, the, at the macroscopic level there. And there is more tissues at the periphery of the lung rather than centrally where there is a cause of vasculature. So uh, it is very difficult to, to, to answer this question, but uh, still we are learning. And still I uh, agree with what the panel said. It is non-specific. It is uh, this thing, this finding can happen in any, any, any infection. Having said that, having the pandemic at the moment, we tend to, whenever we see abnormal chest X-ray, we just will diagnose COVID. And in, in actually in practice, actually we diagnose many COVID on the basis of X-rays. Uh, myself, actually, I had COVID myself, and my, my COVID was initially diagnosed in the basis of the chest X-ray. I had two negative swabs initially. Mm -hmm. uh, eventually, it was put on most positive. So the X-ray is more, is more probably is more diagnostic nowadays, taking the, 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 the fact that we are having pandemic. Uh, I think X-ray now, abnormal chest X-ray, probably more diagnostic than, than the swab. Yeah. Just to, 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 to add one thing, just to uh, follow up on uh, what Dr. Mm. Montasser said, we noticed that our way of reporting chest X-ray has changed a lot in the last two months. So mm. when we used to see these changes initially, we described them as this is possible infection, please treat with antibiotics and repeat the chest X-ray. But now any peripheral changes that we, we see, we just you know describe it as possible covid so just to follow up on what you said. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, I have to comment here also. The lecture was excellent. And um, I have to say that I learned from it. Thank you. Thank, Thank you very much. I indeed. think I, I have to say as well, I learned from it. But another comment, there are something characteristic in these changes. And even the PE, which is it affected the my, my, microvascular 
yes. uh, vessels yes. uh, and and it's always in the periphery we have i have never seen any uh, central uh, pe or massive pe in yeah. all of them. all of them are affecting them the the, the 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 small vessels and yeah. it is in the periphery mm-hmm. and uh, the, maybe we need to look at that and maybe we need more research to see mm-hmm. why this disease only affects the periphery well, do you agree yeah. with that Aladdin, or what do you think yes definitely yeah. most of the changes are as you said definitely preferable yeah, yeah. Well, thank you very much for unifying our picture thank you yeah. it's a pleasure thank you thank you Excellent. Thank you. I think I just well got the one question from the delegate, if you don't mind hint, I think you need to ask question also. I think the question to Dr. Aladdin, and then I will uh, back to you, Hin. So the question from the delegate, they asking after how long we should expect the chest x-ray to come back to the normal, Dr. Aladdin. Very difficult COVID-19. question. Uh, yes, it's a very difficult question. Um, I'm afraid I don't have solid data on that. Uh, we need to look more uh, at our patients and look in depth. All the patients that we've seen so far, as you can expect, you know, the, the pandemic has been for about maybe two months here in the UK. So most of them are still having changes, I think. Um, I don't have an answer for the long term effects, but we do know on CT that some patients have developed some fibrotic lung changes and bronchiectetic changes. But on X-ray, I don't have an answer. I'm afraid we need to look into this. Excellent. Yeah. Thank you, Hint. Uh, do you have a question for Dr. Yeah, Mahir or Dr. Actually, Montasero? Actually, there is a question from the delegate, one of the audiences as well. Uh, they um, question actually about the role of echocardiogram uh, in uh, diagnosing the uh, pulmonary embolism. And the use of echocardiogram, echocardiogram as an alternative to uh, VQ scan. You could um, answer that. You could answer that. <laughs> this is for okay. a cardiology question. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So, okay. As we all know, um, um, the uh, echocardiogram, transtrachic echocardiogram, has a, a low sensitivity. Uh, it's about fifty-six percent. Uh, it, it's, it's, it has high specificity, so it's, it's a very useful um, uh, imaging modality, it's a bedside uh, in the emergency or the critical care as a rule and um, uh, um, uh, method of uh, um, diagnosing PE, but it's because of the sensitivity, uh, it's not really the gold standard for diagnosing PE, but it's a very useful tool. And as I said, it has a high uh, um, specificity and it's in the guidelines. We have to use it. And it's, uh, it depends on the um, availability, of course, of the, the test. The echo is available everywhere. So it might be not, uh, the, the VQ scan might not be available everywhere. But uh, of course, when we have echo, we can use it. It's a very useful tool and um, it can be. Uh, when we do not have a um, uh, other alternative uh, imaging mod- modality, but we have to bear in mind uh, that the uh, specificity is very, uh, the, I mean the sensitivity is low, so we can miss PE uh, if we depend on an on echo alone. So that would be my answer. If anyone would like to add any further comments. Can I add something, please? Yes, of course. <laughs> yeah. Obviously, unless it is a central PE, it's very difficult to diagnose this uh, peripheral small PEs. It should be a very central PE, which is quite obvious. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's operator dependent, depending on who operated and the experience of the operator, really. And the same thing which you have mentioned earlier, it is uh, depend on uh, the, the availability really is not not in every district hospital you could find a very competent uh, 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 echo uh, personnel. Uh, do you think that? Uh, is that? Do you agree with that? Yeah, uh, yeah I agree with you. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Yeah, I agree with you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, another question to Aladdin. Sorry, Aladdin. Yeah, Aladdin. Please go ahead. Yeah. How do you find this? Is a, a practical question. Obviously, in our hospital, we struggle now 
because the the, uh, the the number of CT scan and obviously if you 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 you're going to scan every COVID patient in especially in CT scan, you find it difficult because cleaning the that's uh, you have you have you have to, to to clean obviously the the scan after each patient. Is has is this a, a problem for you on in your trust or and how do you overcome that? Yeah, oh, thanks, Dr. Yeah. Maher. Very good yeah. question. Uh, so yeah. the way we did it in my hospital is that oh. we have two scanners in the A floor uh, next to a &E. So we've dedicated one scanner. We called it the COVID scanner. Yeah. And we separated this with, with a different uh, radi uh, radiographer's team. And we have another scanner for the rest of the hospital. Um, so this has kind of... Uh, reduce these implications as you mentioned uh, of yeah exactly. cleaning after each patient but the the other thing to add is uh we've managed to reduce the number of cts by in in ter and incorporating x-ray more in the initial pathway from ed so if you have um, typical findings on x-ray we will refuse to do ct unless you are absolutely you know, certain that this could be a PE or you have uh, strong other differentials. Okay. Thank you. Thank you uh, very much, Dr. Aladdin. Uh, this pleasure. was a really informative lecture. Now I would like to uh, welcome uh, Dr. Uh, Baik and Professor Shahid Junaju. And thank you very much, Dr. Shahid, by joining us this morning or this afternoon now, I really appreciate it. I can't imagine how you're on call today. You're covering the general medicine, you're covering cardiology, CCU, and you're covering BBI, BBCI also. And we really appreciated that. Now I would like to uh, ask Dr. Mudassir Bey kindly to introduce Dr. Uh, Professor Shahid Junaju. Uh, thank you very much, Ibrahim. Uh, uh, thank you every, every, everybody on the panels. Uh, we welcome Dr. Professor Jinejo, uh, who is an international cardiologist in Sunderland Royal Hospital, uh, to join us for uh, this meeting. Uh, uh, over to you, Dr. G Professor Jinejo. Thank you very much. Assalamu alaikum, everyone. Um, it's, uh, it's a pleasure to be here. And thank you, Ibrahim, for inviting me into this, uh, this whole um, panel. It's a, this is something new. I've not done this before. It's a, it's a new experience, but it's nice to see and hear colleagues. Um, I think we've agreed that uh, we will be providing a formal uh, discussion lecture uh, type presentation in a couple of weeks time. But today is just a brief uh, sort of introduction to um, my thoughts on how we manage heart failure in the current era of um, the COVID world. Um, I'm more than happy to receive any questions and queries and answers um, as we go along. Um, I think one, one, I mean, our experience here is that we are seeing uh, an increasing number of patients who present with symptoms that are significantly uh, overlapped uh, between uh, a COVID presentation or what used to be uh, COPD exacerbation type presentations and heart failure in a population uh, in our territory, which is at least a uh, a high comorbidity, high prevalence of coronary artery disease and high prevalence of coronary artery risk factor uh, in the background. Um, there is a lot of literature from around the world published um, in relation to the precipitation of cardiac decompensation in the context of uh, COVID uh, pandemic. Uh, there is some suggestion that, that there are new cases of myocarditis with clinical presentation of heart failure uh, uh, coming through. There is also uh, good evidence from a paper published, um, uh, I think, day before yesterday in the New England Journal of Medicine by Mandeep Mehra and his colleagues from uh, Brigham Hospital in America. That is a, a registry data uh, from about three continents uh, and 160 hospitals that suggests um, a three, four or a four fold increase in mortality for patients who have pre-existing cardiac failure and then acquire a, a, a COVID infection. So this is, um, th these are difficult times for our patients and these are challenging times for teams that are expected to um, um, ache 
make a diagnosis and be manage these in in circumstances that are very very uh, difficult and very challenging uh, in in infective context in risk reduction context and in ability to give medications um along with that there is clearly the uh, the myth which uh, is around use of ace inhibitors and other medications for patients with covid and whether there is a an uh, an increase or an influence on the outcome for patients who are prescribed these medications i will try and deal with um, a lot of this in the formal talk in a couple of weeks time but um, my um, impression of the literature that i've le- read so far is suggesting that the uh, use of ace inhibitors and angiotensin receptor blockers should not be changed unless there is a clinical need to change and the um, registry data from brigham would suggest that in fact for the population in this registry the patients who survived were more likely to have been on ace inhibitor and arbs than patients who passed away uh, and therefore the myth is a myth we should not in- allow this to influence our decision making um our management strategy for any heart failure irrespective of the etiology should be probably the same as it was prior to the covid pandemic coming through the only caveat that i will put on this is the um diagnosis of obstructive cardiomyopathy with heart failure such as aortic stenosis and so on and so forth where obviously for clinical reasons for physiological reasons we were always cautious in using vasodilators and um, uh, medications that increased uh, contractile force of the ventricle so in, in in that context i think the 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 management of heart failure should be as it was before which is very much dependent on the presentation in the acute decompensation situation you have the ability to use symptomatic treatment with diuretics and nitrates and morphine and oxygen if if necessary and then you have medications that help you to alter the uh, function of the heart and also to be able to influence the outcome from hospital admissions and that includes things like beta blockers ace inhibitors angiotensin receptor blockers and so on and so forth and then in more recently things like sacubitril valsartan and ivabrodine and there is also the short term use of uh, inotropes that has been prevalent for a lot of time there have, we have always for the last 30 to 40 years hoped that there would be some randomized trial evidence that will give us strength and confidence in using inotropes confidently unfortunately all the data that i have seen and that has been published uh, particularly in relation to things like dobutamine and milrinone uh, suggests that the longer to longer term and sustained use of these inotropes is not associated with an improved outcome now it is difficult to be absolutely sure whether that is because the medication is influencing the outcome or whether the patients in which we use these medications are so highly comorbid and unwell that their outcome would be poor anyway um, there are very few randomized control trial data on this but those that are available are actually not very strongly positive having said that a lot of us do in shorter terms use inotropes to try and see if we can bail ourselves out of difficult situations and i have used dobutamine as recently as last night in a patient who is in a very very um decompensated stage with acute kidney injury a potassium of 7.9 who is currently being dialyzed as of last night with all the inotropic and nitrate support that i could give him so yes i think we 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 have the prerogative of using these med- these medications as and when in clinical situation but the way i looked at managing heart failure is to divide uh, my therapeutic uh, options into those that are for symptomatic use and those that are for prognosis modifying use and then in you, you know i uh, i mix and match depending on what the background um, sort of tolerance of patients is for example patients with asthma or severe copd who might not tolerate 
um, a, a, a very high dose beta blocker, then you have the uh, option of um, using something like evabradine if they are in sinus rhythm. We are obviously not using evabradine in atrial fibrillation and so on and so forth. So uh, there are um, there are those I use ACE inhibitors and ARBs very very aggressively, and I'm now in more recent times using to uh, trying to use. Um, uh, Secubitril valsartan in as a first line medication in patients who are admitted with decompensated heart failure, and this is from my own personal experience. We were one of the sites for doing uh, a transitions study, which was essentially um, using secubitril valsartan in patients who were initially admitted with decompensated heart failure, then stabilized with standard therapy, and then randomizing them to Secubitril varsartan to be initiated prior to discharge and uh, or um, uh, uh, after discharge. Uh, and the results of the transitions um, uh, studies would suggest that the sooner we get secubitril varsartan into patients, the better their outcome is with reduced hospitalization and reduced um, clinical events. So my experience now is consolidated and uh, I try to use uh, diuretics upfront to try and stabilize and then get out of the IV diuretic as best as quickly as I can and then move on to doing prognosis modifying medications. I'm deliberately not talking about other investigations and deliberately not talking about revascularization because that's a completely different, different topic and completely different aspect. But in terms of medical management, upfront symptomatic management and then prognosis modification and then looking at Obviously, I've not mentioned things like devices, the CRT, and the influence of ECG, and so on and so forth on longer term management. But I'll try and address that in the in the formal talk uh, in a couple of weeks' time. So that was what I was going to say uh, initially, uh, Ibrahim. Is there anything else uh, or any any questions uh, my colleagues wish to ask? Thank you, Dr. Ginejo. That was really uh, good and informative. I think uh, what we saw from the beginning to prepare uh, just like few case presentation and then we yes. could share it with you. But of yes. course, we're planning now to move that to the uh, upcoming webinar. I think it's going to be in two weeks time. But That's I think correct. meanwhile, I do remember recently, Dr. Ginejo, I have seen patient in our cardiology ward and I'm so glad to be working with you and with Dr. Modester and all the team in Sunderland Hospital. I remember I've seen young chap, he coming from London, just visiting his uh, brother, I think in Sunderland. And then uh, suddenly he develops severe breathlessness admitted to our uh, unit. And then subsequently echocardiogram shows severe biventricular failure with ejection fraction 20. So, I mean, in this era now, uh, COVID-19 era, I think uh, to initiate the medication in hospital, I think it's a big challenging heart failure medication. And the other things also, how this medication is going to be a titration in the community. We used to have the heart failure team in the community who has uh, always picked up this patient quickly. So, I mean, my, my question now, what, what, what's your approach to this kind of things now? Do you call, call the contact, do you contact them directly or do you have any I, I, recommendations? No, thank you. It, it, it is absolutely a very val valid question. And I think it is, it is, these are challenging times. I think, um, uh, and I, I, I clearly remember the patient. I think if you, if you remove the last 10 years of uh, heart failure management advances that have taken place, we felt that we were back 10 years in the days when we were the only people dealing with these patients and we didn't have the infrastructure in the community or anywhere else to, to help us. Um, in the current climate, I think if the patient is hemodynamically stable, then the risk of acquiring a COVID infection in hospital and becoming very unwell and perhaps increased mortality as a consequence is a, a very, very significant threat. And in this context, the way I have managed patients is that if they are clinically sta stable, then I can discharge and probably titrate the medication slower outside in the community rather than do what we have previously been doing, which is up titrating very rapidly when they're in hospital. Um, having said that, in this particular patient, if you remember, they were hemodynamically stable, although it was an unusual um, uh, and unexpected severe cardiomyopathy. 
we went with titrating, introducing beta blocker and an ARB, and then we went on to increase the dose of the ARB and get them out of the hospital with, uh, man with a management strategy that the community team would pick them up um, eventually and of, on face to face. But we are blessed in our in, in our current arrangements to have two facilities where patients can turn up to have their blood tests done. So if we make contact with the patient by phone and we instruct them to go and get their renal function checked, we can actually look at the blood results and then advise them over the phone how to change and prescriptions can be delivered and medications can be done. Now that is probably easier done in the Western setting where there is an infrastructure. It might not be that easily possible in other healthcare uh, provider systems where perhaps the community uh, services are not as well structured. And, and it is a challenge. And in that situation, you have to then decide whether it is fine to leave the patient on a smaller dose with uh, over a longer term and titrate it at a later date when you can see them, or you take a risk of bringing them into hospital and then uh, changing the dose and with all precautions that you can put in place and then see them again and again in that setting. Thank you, Dr. Ginejo. Just going back to the same patient, uh, if you remember, he he the young chap. He's, uh, I believe, I think he's an uh, ex-smoker, and his main, but the main presentation was breathlessness and palpitation. I do remember he, he was in fast AF uh, yes. atrial fibrillation with rapid ventricular response. Yes. So I think the question now for my from myself as cardiology registrar and from the uh, other colleague also general physician. How do you treat arrhythmia, this kind of arrhythmia in heart failure situation? Do you recommend just like rate control medication? Would you recommend this patient to be referred for ablation? No, I think, uh, again, a ve very, very valid question. And I think my first um, so attempt has always been to try and return back to nature. Nature did not want us to have atrial fibrillation. Uh, atrial fibrillation decompensates and therefore, if you can bring them back to sinus rhythm, it probably is the best option for them. Um, my, uh, how should I say, the easiest tool that I have is DC cardioversion. Um, I, I try and stabilize with medical treatment and I then plan for elective cardioversion in about four to six weeks time for two reasons. One. Uh, in the context of heart failure, particularly if the ventricles are dilated and stuff, medications are not as reliable in returning to and maintaining sinus rhythm. Uh, and electrical cardioversion is perhaps a better way of doing it. Um, and if you can achieve, I mean, physiologically, if you, if you remember, uh, going back to the physiology of, of cardiovascular system, 25% of the cardiac output is depending on atrial contribution to left ventricular filling. So very easily, if somebody with an impaired ventricle goes into or develops atrial fibrillation, they have not only got a lower ejection fraction to start off with, they have decompensated further by losing another quarter of their overall ejection fraction. And that in most cases is very poorly tolerated. So my uh, plans have always been to try and restore sinus to them as best I can. There is some suggestion in published literature in recent times to suggest that uh, if there is a strong suspicion that atrial fibrillation is a big contributor to ongoing symptoms and reduced quality of life, then going further with ablation therapy after trying cardioversion or medical treatment is probably a sensible thing to do because symptomatically restoring sinus rhythm um, uh, affects not only the quality of life, it affects uh, cardiovascular function as well. So in, in, in a roundabout way, answering the question you've asked is my first attempt is to uh, treat the acute decompensation, stabilize the patient. Second attempt to put back into sinus rhythm, whichever modality I can, whether they will come back with IV metoprolol while they're in, or whether they will stabilize and then go for an elective cardioversion. And then if that doesn't work, um, I would then aim to be referring for cardioversion once they're clinically stable. You just need to be, sorry, not cardioversion, for ablation when they're stable. You just need to be uh, careful that ablation in itself is a fairly taxing procedure for the cardiovascular system. And uh, as far as I understand from my electrophysiology colleagues, they would rather have a stable person 
uh, established on treatment to then work with them to try and get uh, the pulmonary vein isolation done and restore sinus to them rather than do an AF ablation in an acutely decompensated patient. Thank you, Dr. Gineju. Uh, just before I leave Dr. Beg and the other two comment, just last two questions. So the, yes. uh, I'll say I'm junior doctor or might be just cardiology registrar. If I got a huge heart failure patient, and yes. recently we got the DABA half trial, which is showing that the SGL2 is very good uh, medication for the heart failure patient. And we know that exactly, believe it, so we've got mineral corticoid, we've got AC inhibitor, we've got beta blocker. So now I got five medication. Which one should I start first? Shall I start with beta blocker? Shall I start with AC inhibitor? Shall I start with uh, SGL2? Or what, do you have, what would you recommend for that? Well, uh, if you look at the data published from each of them, the, the starting medications, uh, I mean, you, 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 you are now preempting my talk for the two weeks time, but I will, I will, um, I will summarize and try and still keep some, some, some of the information safe for next time. If you look at how we have evolved in the management of heart failure, we started off by doing things like uh, isocerbide dinitrate and hydralazine infusions. That was back in the 80s for heart failure. Then came the ACE inhibitor, then came the, you know, and diuretics have always been the spine in terms of um, uh, treatment of symptoms and so on and so forth. Uh, there, there is good evidence for things like uh, using hydro, you know, hydrochlorothiazide based diuretics onto prognosis in heart failure as well and hypertension. So my uh, sort of sequence of introduction usually is that I try and do beta blocker ACE inhibitors together in the one go. I then aim for adding a mineralocorticoid if I can, and, and then revisit and see what they are doing in four to six weeks time. And this is in stable outpatient uh, situation. If possible, then we've got clear evidence that secubitral valsartan is better than using ACE inhibitors. Um, and therefore, I try and see if I can convert to that if I possibly can. Along the way, somewhere in the middle, I will talk things like a plerinone and spironolactone as well. There is clearly good data around dapagliflozin, or, or, the, or the gliflozin as it were, SELT2 inhibitors. We are now getting myosin activators. We are now getting the... Um, soluble guanylate cyclase um, uh, advancers as well. So good studies, the galac galactic uh, heart failure, the Victoria, uh, Socrates, all these studies are looking at novel ways of changing heart failure medication. Um, I think, you know, in, in sequence, if you, who, I don't think this is about being right or wrong. It is about A, what resources are available and B, what you are comfortable with and what experience you've gained over the years. And therefore, symptomatic treatment with diuretic, add in a beta blocker and an ARB ACE inhibitor, if you can, uh, and then move on to secubitral valsartan and along there, somewhere in the middle, add in the mineralocorticoid and see how things go. The DAPA stuff, yes, it is independent of diabetes. It is uh, an independent... At the moment, my understanding of the DAPA data is that we don't know how exactly it causes an improvement in heart failure. There is speculation around the diuretic or the glycosuric effect of DAPA, uh, which it clearly reduces fluid overload and so on and so forth. And therefore it is postulated to be one mechanism by which heart failure is treated in, in this group or by this medication. I must admit that I'm not using DAPA as a first line treatment primarily for heart failure but I am working with the metabolic medicine team here to see whether, especially in diabetes and patients who are known to have diabetes and coronary artery disease with heart failure, that we are going down the SCL2 as a, as a first line uh, medication from a diabetes point of view as well. Thank you very much. I think we got Dr. Nasreen al Ghassim from Sudan. Dr. Nasreen, would you like to? Yeah, yeah go ahead. Yes, uh, uh, yes, uh, um, I think, uh, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Uh, Shahid, uh, uh, for uh, uh, your comments and uh, your interpretation. Uh, actually, here in Sudan, definitely uh, things are totally different from being there in the UK, uh, especially dealing with the level of the in infrastructure and when you don't have a very good health system. Actually, it's not a good health, health system at all. So uh, in the context of heart failure, we just, we just have established just only a clinic. 
a multidisciplinary clinic for treating heart failure patients that involves uh, cl uh, clinical pharmacists, uh, psychologists, um, uh, dietitians, and uh, cardiac rehabilitation team, uh, a doctor, and a trained nurse. But this is not available at the level of the community. So now, when I'm concerned with having my patients that I need to up trade them with the ARBs and ACE inhibitors, and now we are at the stage of the community transmission of COVID. Uh, whenever you have an elderly patient, you don't know who is his contacts, and then he encounters heart failure, uh, and the suspicion of COVID, when things are not well established and with not a good established system, and here comes the question of the up titration and the need of the ARBs and the beta blockers for improving the mortality and the morbidity of the patients. And at the same time, um, the possible deterioration of the COVID uh, as maybe it can cause hypertension or uh, anything. So uh, the balance, I do believe it, it, it will be difficult to, to, to manage this balance even in uh, good communities. So it will Absolutely. be even worse for us in our community. Uh, and even when the the patient, yeah, and even when the patient is now ill in front of you, and uh, and you need to deal with his heart failure and to improve his heart condition with the uh, prognosis improving medications. At the same time, you are uh, with the problem of the hypertension or whatever complications you can have. It will really add much more difficulties to this situation when you don't have a good primary health care and yeah, and all the dilemmas together. So an insight or. Well, no, thank, yeah. thank you. It is, I mean, I, my, my background is um, I, I graduated in Pakistan many, many years ago, and I'm familiar with the frustrations and the difficulties that, that you have for having the patient with the disease, but not having the system to deal with the disease. So I, I, can, I can fully appreciate and understand where you're coming from. Um, my guidance or suggestion, if I may, in, in a situation like this is you can only do what you can do. And yes, you're, you're, you're working in very difficult circumstances. Uh, you have patients who have multiple problems. You have patients who have less means and ability to look after themselves or to um, acquire healthcare, uh, sort of uh, whichever way uh, th that might be, whether they pay for it or whether, uh, you know, they buy health services or whatever, or even support. I, I think there is no shortage of moral support because there are big extended family systems and, and there are quite a lot of people to pray for them and look after them. But there is very much great shortage of having medical facilities and having technical and professional know-how to try and uh, make people better and um, and help them in that respect. Uh, I would strongly recommend that you concentrate hard on training your team. Once you have your team, then that team will be extending the training to other people around them. Um, as an example, I can give you even in the best, you know, in the first world, so as we call it in the U UK, I, in my clinic, um, I have two physiologists who are cardiac physiologists who have trained to do echo and ambulatory CGs and treadmills and cath lab work who have done their clinical skills and now are doing their clinical work and they run my clinic for me. From them, we get another layer of professionals who are capable and can deal with these. The only why, the reason why I put that example is that a lot of people have done things with training phys pharmacists and nurses, but there are other resources. So you have, for example cardiac physiologists who are doing echocardiography for you and who are giving you, you know, who are in contact with patients. If they have the clinical skills as well and the clinical knowledge with your backing to try and adjust medications or advise on adjusting medications, not that they can prescribe because physiologists will not be able to train for prescription, but they can be a via media to, to, to communicate what you are saying to patients and so on and so forth in remote areas. And therefore, there is an opportunity to try and build that kind of resource around you. Uh, but I think there is no, um, no replacement of having a good nursing team and good pharmacy team who can uh, communicate backwards between yourselves and patients um, and, and adjust medications. That's as much as I can. You concentrate on the cohort of patients you've got closer to you, get them established first, and then expand rather than trying to do a big piece of work with small amount of resources. Thank you very much. Thank you. Shahid, I have a question for you. Uh, uh, I have a question. 
Yeah, of course. Okay. I yeah, I have a question for Dr. Janajan. Thank you very much for this talk. Um, uh, actually, my question about the HFPEP. We started to see a lot of patients, uh, HFPEP patients, and I find them very difficult to treat. And my question, uh, the evidence of uh, the use of beta blockers and ACE inhibitors in those patients, if we have the evidence, are they uh, uh, are there very strong and robust um, evidence as um, in the um, HEFREF or um, we're still waiting for further uh, trials and evidences from uh, big uh, studies and trials. They're very difficult patient to treat actually, those patients. Yeah. And uh, according to my experience, mm -hmm. yeah. so uh, according to my uh, experience, um, uh, with those patients, they are, uh, you know, even with the use of all this heart failure medication, still we find a difficulty to control and um, their heart failure. So what's your um, um, uh, opinion about that? If you give us, I know it's a, it's a, it's a big topic, the, yeah. the, yeah. the health is a big topic, but. Uh, no, you, you, you're, you're right, you're right. Um, um, it, it, is, it is a very, very challenging group of people, uh, of patients. Um, the data as what is available is mainly around um, either as part of overall heart failure patient studies and a smaller number of uh, focus studies on uh, preserved ejection fraction. My understanding of the data is that the conventional treatments that we see are effective in managing patients with reduced ejection fraction do not work with patients with normal or preserved ejection fraction. The pathophysiology is uh, slightly debated and debatable. Uh, the suggestions being that uh, perhaps HEFPEF is a precursor of reduced ejection fraction heart failure and that we are just catching these patients on, on the earlier part of, their, uh, of the spectrum and therefore symptomatic treatment seem to work a little bit better. So things like diuretics have an ongoing evidence base in its use. I must admit that I have used nitrates with some symptomatic benefit in some patients, um, similar to what you see in isolated right heart failure patients where you, where you use to try and reduce the inflow into the right ventricle. So a combination of maybe nitrate and diuretic is something that I've used and, and diuretic certainly proven, nitrate maybe anecdotal. Um, the evidence for ACE inhibitors, ARBs, not very uh, helpful in the context of uh, uh, preserved ejection fraction heart failure. Uh, the heart rate stuff is a very different uh, beast altogether. Um, I must admit, I think um, I am a... Uh, I've studied heart rate and the impact of heart rate in uh, healthy as well as uh, sick populations for the last maybe 16 to 17 years. Um, we've been part of uh, uh, Clarify registry data, uh, international date registry looking at uh, influence of heart rate on outcomes and so on and so forth. Uh, we've been part of Evabradine establishment studies, a shift and the beautiful um, and I am a great believer in the fact that if you have a heart rate at rest of between 50 and 60 beats a minute, and you can slow the progression of heart rate rise with exercise um, in any patient or healthy population, then that seems to influence the longer term survival, whether they are healthy people or whether they are ill people. We have understood heart rate as being a marker for a poor outcome. We use that in news scores when we assess patients uh, as a marker for a poor outcome in ill patients in hospital. In healthy population, a higher heart rate also suggests a shorter lifespan in 20 to 30 years time for population. So I think there is something that about heart rate that convinces me that if a patient with heart failure symptoms as a heart rate of above 70 beats per minute, then I do try and bring that rate down to between 60 and 70 if I possibly can. 
that may be with the use of beta blocker if required, and that may be with the use of evabridine if beta blocker is not tolerated. Uh, I personally believe that even though the data currently is not robust, in the fullness of time, we will find that this, this impacts positively. That's my feeling. The other comment I would make is just, um, I'm looking at, there is a, there's a drug called Omicamtiv Micarbil, which is basically a myosin filament agonist or activator. That is coming through. It was studied in um, one of the galactic heart failure studies uh, recently, which is published as well. Uh, and that's worth, worth uh, um, uh, a read. Um, it, it is a very novel concept in uh, the suggestion is that for people with at the early, very early stages of heart failure, the systolic force of contraction is affected. And if you can enhance that systolic force of contraction, you might have a different outcome for that patient population. That is the suggestion. But I, I would recommend that if you have access to galactic heart failure study paper, I think it's published either in JAK or in NEJM, that it's worthwhile reading that and understanding the physiology of this, uh, this molecule because I think that might answer some of the questions around the preserved ejection fraction heart failure patients. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, You're welcome. Uh, Shahid, I have a question for you. It's, uh, yes, let's, yes, come back, let's come back to the COVID world. Right. All, all new patients coming with a new heart failure. Yes. COVID myocarditis will be on the yes. list of differential diagnosis. That is correct. So, so how would you assess these patients in terms of their diagnosis uh, and the treatment strategies? Would there be any difference? Um, I, I think the clinical assessment and the management strategy is exactly the same as you would have for heart failure of any other cause or description. Uh, I, if we take the term COVID out of the discussion and put flu or influenza, cardiomyopathy. We've seen this for several years. We've seen people with uh, flu-like illnesses who present with heart failure and we've investigated and managed them. What we don't have at the moment is the historical data because COVID has been only around for five or six months in, uh, in our lives. But, and maybe next year, maybe the year after, we will have a two-year, three-year database of these patients to, uh, to help us make uh, uh, decisions around uh, investigations and management strategies. But at this point in time, I would not manage this in any way different from a primarily viral cardiomyopathy presentation. Um, in terms of investigation, I think ECHO is the gold standard, as we all know. Um, I think... Um, MRI scan will play a role in those survivors of COVID cardiomyopathy eventually uh, who will perhaps be a source of learning for all of us in, in understanding what the pathophysiology of, of, of this particular cardiomyopathy is. I suspect it won't be any different from the common, you know, common day viral cardiomyopathy, but it will be worthwhile looking at MRI data uh, on, on these patients in the fullness of time. But currently, Clearly, because of the risk of infection and cross-infection and the need for cleaning equipment, you don't send people to MRI that lightly. Um, so we are actually managing them on the basis of uh, transthoracic echocardiogram, biochemistry, clinical presentation, chest x-rays, and our current strategies of managing heart failure. So uh, what I'm getting is that uh, myocarditis is a kind of a diagnosis after excluding the usual causes of the heart failure. Uh, yeah. And uh, that will still apply for the COVID myocarditis if it exists. Now, do you think that serial troponins, CK levels and things like that would help you in management of acute heart failure in these situations once you have excluded the other causes? I, the, the, data from, uh, the data that I'm seeing emerging from the COVID publications, be that by the, um, the NIHR uh, or CDC or the Wuhan uh, uh, sort of uh, publications, and now the Brigham publication that has come out two days ago, is suggesting it doesn't, I mean, measurement of things like uh, BNP and troponins is a very, very strong marker for outcome it is not necessarily a, a helpful 
uh, indicator of how your management is is going to be in the acute stage. You, I, I think for, again, data collection, as you know, we are just about starting to collect data on our COVID patients in the Sunderland region in, in collaboration with other colleagues in the region with other three or four hospitals. Uh, and we are looking at exactly some of that data around um, uh, frailty scores, background respiratory illnesses, background cardiac illnesses, and the presentation with troponins, BNPs, and uh, electrolytes, and so on and so forth. Uh, I suspect in the fullness of time, we will be, for patients who survive the COVID with primarily COVID cardi cardiomyopathies, we will have to see what the pattern of distribution of these results is, whether the, you know, whether the troponins uh, go high and then come down to a baseline level or they remain high in these patients, or how the BNP behaves in predicting outcome. But for in the shorter term, a presence of high troponin and serial troponins showing a continuous rise is a very bad prognostic marker. And, and also, with regard to the treatment of myocarditis and myopericarditis picture, the role of steroids in these situations, uh, what do you think of that? Uh, at this point in time, there, does, there doesn't seem to be any evidence of using steroids, and there are very few people who are actually advocating steroids. There are there are pockets, and there are anecdotal reports coming through about um, in you know short case series of people uh, changing or responding. Uh, I'm not sure that is true evidence. I think uh, it, these are anecdotes. We wait and see for randomized evidence to appear as and when it will. At this point in time, we, apart from standard treatment of heart failure, um, over and above any coexisting infection, there is no evidence for, for the use of steroids or for antiviral drugs or for antimalarial drugs at this point in time in influencing the outcome from cardiac presentations of COVID that I'm aware of. Uh, thank you, Shahid. Uh, any other questions? The general question uh, about, um, is there any relation between COVID-19 and vitamin D? And uh, do you consider uh, giving supplementation of vitamin D to patients with COVID? This is a, a, a question from one of the audience. Yeah. So. Uh, I, think, I think there is some anecdotal evidence that having uh, higher levels of vitamin D is protective in terms of immune modulation of some description. I'm not sure I've seen any robust evidence to say that this is a, a, an established treatment. Um, I think uh, we, are, um, we are all vitamin D deficient, whatever, whether we like it or not, even in places where there is a lot of sun, there are people who are uh, vitamin D deficient um, and vitamin D is prescribed to a lot of people. Uh, I'm, I'm not suggesting that we should take it, but I am saying that if somebody is taking it, I wouldn't stop it. No. Okay, thank you very much. You're welcome. Any other questions from the team? Uh, I think, uh, thank you very much, uh, Professor Junaja. Thank uh, you very for much. For joining us. Yes, and I'll, I hope to see you tomorrow. <laughs> Inshallah, looking forward to it. Thank you, thank you very yes. much and uh, have a, have a good rest of the meeting and thank you very much for your very very uh, uh, interesting questions it, it just feeds back into the data stuff that we are accumulating thank you very much thank you very much very appreciate it so i think now we're going to move to uh, our next speaker dr ahmed the tom dr ahmed can you hear me uh, yeah dr abdul i can hear you very well good so now i put your uh, slide can you see your slide yeah, I can, I can see it, yeah. Okay, that's fine, go ahead. Uh, uh, good afternoon, uh, everybody. Uh, first of all, I would like to thank uh, Dr. Abdulazim for organizing such will organize an informative conference webinar. Uh, and also uh, thank all my colleagues uh, who just joined us today. And special thank for Dr. Mahit Hamad for continuous support for the doctor. Uh, uh, today, I would like to talk about uh, neutrobenic sepsis because uh, it is a quite uh, important topic and it is a medical emergency. Uh, and it's just like a uh, heart attack and stroke. And if it's not 
he did it very well. It can lead to very serious consequences. Uh, can we go to the next slide, please? Uh, and the next. Uh, so I will start by uh, giving a case scenario uh, for 55 year old lady. She is a known acute myeloid leukemia uh, admitted to the hospital for elective cycle two chemotherapy. Uh, otherwise, her background, she is quite fit and healthy without any chronic disease. And her fertility score uh, uh, two, that means she is quite an active lady. On day 10 of her chemotherapy, she became pancytopenic. Uh, her neutrophil count uh, was 0 0.2, uh, pelated uh, 30 and HP 76. And because she is neutrophilic, she moved to the side room. Uh, before that, she is in, in the bay with the patient who just recently diagnosed with COVID-19 uh, two, two days back. So she got a, a contact with the patient who is COVID positive. Can you go down the slide? Uh, uh, at the night, she, she got a mild cough and she spiked in British at 38. Uh, and the doctor at night uh, treated her as usual intravenous sepsis according to the protocol by uh, taking a blood culture, give IV fluids, antibiotic, and uh, uh, they also done all the septic screening, including a COVID swab. Uh, okay. uh, her observation at that time where the SATs is 91 on room air, uh, respiratory rate 24, uh, blood pressure 110 over 67, and the heart rate is 108. Uh, the temperature is stated. On examination, uh, according to the documentation, uh, the doctor found this bilateral structure. And the ABG at that time was normal, and the test X-ray showed a bilateral airspace scheduling. Could we have X-ray, please? Uh, so it's have X-ray at that time. So we can see there's uh, some obesity and uh, airspace scheduling. Can you go to the next slide? Yeah. In the following day in the morning, she became more unwell and she required more oxygen. She became more tacky and uh, uh, respiratory 30, uh, saturation 92 on 4 liters of oxygen. It has rate 112 uh, and blood pressure is the same. Uh, her blood test at that time, the neutrophil is uh, going down 0 0.1, uh, platelet 21, and HCB 74. Because the patient on uh, day 10 of chemotherapy, we expect the patient uh, uh, full blood count and the neutrophil is going down because when the chemotherapy is uh, going forward, the blood count and uh, neutrophil is going to be more and more. So it's very difficult. The patient is going ahead for a transit to be near more and more. At that time, also her protein and, and D dimer uh, were high. Uh, but thankfully, the clotting and user and user uh, liver function tests were normal. Uh, and as ABG showed, type 1 is a better failure. Can we do the case? On the same day, her oxygen demand increased to 50 liters, and the COVID swab uh, came back as positive. So she got the COVID um, uh, pneumonitis. Uh, CT showed a ground glass appearance and a repeated ABG. It was in uh, type 1 respiratory failure. According to our uh, hospital policy in such kind of patient, uh, we uh, usually shift them from the usual hematology or oncology ward or medical ward uh, to a uh, respiratory uh, ward for uh, supporting by CPAP. And if the patient is for more uh, escalation, they can move them to ITU or CDU. So the patient uh, moved to um, respiratory ward uh, for CBAP, and uh, I think later on also he went to HDU. Uh, can we go more? Uh, this is her uh, CT. Okay, well, yeah. Uh, so, uh, nitrobenic sepsis, uh, as I said, it is a quite a uh, very important topic. Uh, if it's not treated very well, can lead to a very serious consequences and complications. Uh, I will start by giving a definition about uh, neutropenia. It is an absolute neutrophilic count 
less than 0 0.5. Uh, and the fever it is a temperature more than or equal to 68. Um, and also sepsis uh, is a systemic response syndrome for infection, uh, which can manifested by a high temperature or hypothermia, temperature more than 38 or less than 36. And also it can be manifested by tachycardia, uh, tachypnea or hypertension. This is the sepsis. Uh, septic shock uh, is a severe uh, uh, hypotension despite adequate fluid resuscitation and uh, usually it requires anitrop or vasopressor. Um, uh, uh, in some patients also the neutrophil uh, is not, they no neutrophil to produce fever and uh, they can present with hypothermia. And any patient who present with rigor or hypotension and nitropenic should be treated with as nitropenic sepsis. So the message here is any nitropenic patient who came un unwell, come with, came to the hospital with high fever or hypothermia or rigor or generally unwell, we have to think about nitropenic sepsis and have to start the, the treatment as soon as possible. Can we go to the next slide, please? So nitropenic sepsis is uh, considered as the primary cause of mortality in 36 patient uh, percent of cancer patient. And also it's considered a secondary cause of mortality in 68 percent of cancer patient. And in the most common cause of mortality and morbidity in cancer patient. Slide this. Uh, the cause of nitropenic sepsis is the uh, there's failure to production of neutrophil from the bone marrow uh, or the destruction of neutrophil outside, <coughs> sorry, outside of the bone marrow. And the other causes also for, for, for neutropenia. Uh, uh, the category one is the production uh, of neutrophil from the bone marrow affected either by the disease in the bone marrow itself or by a, an external agent that suppress the bone marrow. Uh, the disease itself like leukemia uh, so leukemia itself can cause anitropenia and also other hematology uh, conditions like uh, uh, NDS or myelogenous elastic syndrome. And most, most commonly, the chemotherapy is the leading cause of anitropenia we've seen in our hospital. Uh, uh, and also uh, radiation to, uh, to the body can cause anitropenia. Uh, a destruction outside the bone marrow may be by autoimmune disease like rheumatoid arthritis or lupus, and there's other medication can cause uh, uh, neutropenia other than chemotherapy, like there's some antibiotic, some antipsychotic, and also some antibiotic medication. Uh, and uh, infection commonly HIV and tuberculosis also can lead to neutropenia. And next slide, please. Uh, so here, there's a uh, genetic uh, uh, and acquired uh, uh, cause of uh, neutropenia. Um, in adults, uh, we, as I said, mainly malignancy, infection, drug, and autoimmune. Next slide. So the presentation um, mainly uh, with the fever. Uh, we've seen a lot of patients uh, came to the hospital with the fever. Uh, it's a classical presentation, but also the patient can uh, came with hypotension, with hypothermia tachycardia and confusion with feeling generally unwell, and uh, the other uh, sign and symptom of infection in the lung, like cough, shortness of breath, and according to the system involved, cellulitis, diarrhea, and dysuria if there's urinary sepsis. Yeah, next slide. And so in history and examination, uh, it is uh, very important to inquire about a recent treatment with chemotherapy. Um, most likely in the last six weeks, because at this, at this time, the, the, the risk of neutropenia is very high, and we have to take a full drug history. And most of the patients uh, will have a chemotherapy alert card with them to determine what kind of chemotherapy they're receiving. And also, uh, in the note, we find uh, the patient doctor or consultant. So uh, if you 
at you are doubt of anything you can contact the doctor uh, number or the consultant to clarify this type of chemotherapy for you and um, also we have to look for the infection uh, symptom um, like general like rigor fear unwell um, you have to also ask about cough sputum difficulty in breathing uh, in the urinary, urinary system you have to ask about lion pain dysuria any discharge and uh, if there's any history of decline insertion you have to look for a redness or sign of inflammation at the site of the decline or there's any discharge uh, next slide uh, we have to also ask about symptoms of sinusitis, nasal congestion, uh, any runny nose, uh, all of these symptoms of uh, ENT problems. Uh, you have to inquire about diarrhea, tummy pain, uh, and skin for any skin rash, any redness, any soreness in the skin. All of these just to by system by system because we need uh, to take a very good history to find out exactly what, what is the site of this infection and in the cns also you've seen a patient coming with a symptom like meningitis and photophobia uh, and um, very mild wound also can cause uh, sepsis for this kind of patient because this patient is quite immune compromised and anything any simple thing can cause sepsis for them so we have to be very vigilant and uh, take up proper history and proper examination to identify the source. Uh, next, please. So what investigation we need to do for uh, an intravenic patient or patient coming with sepsis? Uh, uh, generally, we will do a couple account, looking for uh, neutropenia, thrombocytopenia, uh, anemia, uh, and also a clotting screen. We know uh, sepsis can derail the clotting. And, and also can uh, cause a kidney injury. And so we need to do an use and ease. Uh, liver function tests, CRP, and blood culture is very important also from the periphery and also from the center line, decline or HICMA line. Uh, most patients on chemotherapy, they receive a chemotherapy by a decline. So we have to uh, think about this because the treatment in this kind of patient is difficult for the patient without the facility. We have to do a PVD and looking for lactate. Uh, yeah, next slide. Uh, full infection screen is very important uh, to identify and to know what we are treating. So uh, we need to do a urine deep stick, MSU, uh, sputum, uh, and stool culture, uh, and microscopy also, and X ray test if indicated if we think uh, there's uh, a test sepsis, but it's not routine uh, unless you find there's some symptom of chest problem. Uh, for the big line and central line, also we have to uh, take a swap uh, and ensure blood culture was taken from the lumen. Uh, there's two or three lumen sometimes. So we have to take for each lumen, we have to take a sample for, for the blood culture. Next, please. Uh, uh, and also, we have to take a swap for uh, influenza, per influenza, and also in this situation now with the COVID pandemic, uh, it's very important to also send uh, a COVID swap uh, from the nose and also uh, from the mouse, uh, pharyngeal uh, swap. And uh, we need to be very careful about inserting a urinary catheter or doing a PR because it can uh, lead to transient bacteria and also it can uh, introduce an infection for this kind of patient. Uh, and we need to avoid intramuscular injection because of the risk of infection itself. And uh, this patient uh, is immunocompromised and the platelet is quite low. So there's a risk of bleeding and risk of coagulopathy also. Next. Uh, in terms of treatment, uh, uh, the very important message is to treat nitrobenic sepsis on suspicion only. You don't need to wait for the result of um, the investigation. 
So mainly in ANE, if uh, you've got a patient who is a cancer patient on chemotherapy on the last six weeks, uh, the patient comes with a symptom of sepsis or uh, generally unwell, hypotensive, hypothermic, confusion. Uh, in this case, I think it's very important to treat as neutropenic sepsis until proven otherwise. Uh, because uh, we found that um, if the treatment is delayed, so uh, here this kind of affects the prognosis very, uh, very much. If the patient is treated, uh, is treated away very well with fluid resuscitation, with antibiotic is started in less than one hour. So here the outcome is quite good. And this kind of patient can deteriorate very, very quickly. Um, um, and when the patient comes to ANE, uh, there is some in the mass score index, uh, which is a multinational association for supportive care in cancer. We use this score to uh, identify whether this patient is um, the severity is high here or not. Uh, and this uh, this one, we, we take the age, the comorbidity of the patient, and the, the vital sign at that time when the patient presented to any. And we used to stratify the patient into high risk or low risk according to the certain score. If the patient score more than or equal to 21, that means this, this patient is at a low risk. Uh, so in low risk patient, we can start uh, oral antibiotic and admit the patient. But if the score is low, that means this patient uh, are high risk of complication from the sepsis and we have to start them with appropriate IV antibiotic. Uh, as a parameter we are using, usually we take the age, uh, the history of COPD and uh, systolic blood pressure at that time. And also if this is a solid tumor or it is a hematological problem. So it is a different, uh, it's a different and difficult uh, uh, score. Uh, we have to calculate it and after that to decide about about the, the, the plan for him. Uh, next slide. Uh, uh, very important to resuscitate the patient according to A, B, C, D, D approach if the hemodynamic is unstable uh, and to start sepsis 6 on suspicion and we don't need to wait for the results of the investigation. And in, in high risk patient, we have to start uh, GCSF, which is a uh, granulocyte stimulating factor. It's going to help boosting the neutrophil count. And usually, uh, it depends actually the dose according to the patient weight, but uh, in, uh, we can say uh, 300 microgram is the, the medium uh, dose we can give, but it depends on the patient weight. Next, please. Yeah, this is the sepsis six. Uh, is uh, a six parameter. We have to do all of these in less than one hour. We have to give uh, an oxygen um, to keep the sat more than 94. Uh, actually, this is different from patient to, to other. If there's a patient with a history of COPD, so uh, uh, the oxygen sat here is different. And we have to take blood culture, and give IV antibiotic uh, less than one hour. Uh, give fluid challenge, uh, measure lactate, and also to measure the urine output because it's quite important for a sepsis patient uh, to calculate the urine output and also uh, lactate uh, give a prognostic factor also. If the lactate is normal, uh, that means this patient is not at high risk. But for example, if you find a lactate of more than four or three or five, so uh, this patient here is quite septic and need to be treated aggressively. Uh, patient should be nurse in, in a side room and uh, uh, the protective isolation sign should be very clear and display on the door. Uh, because why side room? Because uh, this patient has high risk of getting a, an infection from other. So we keep them on the side room and uh, Initially, the minimum for four hourly observation uh, by vital sign, taking temperature, pulse, and all the vital sign. And it should be increased to hourly if 
the vital sign is not stable or in the trigger zone. We have to direct. Uh, can you go back, please? Uh, We have to select fluid balance, uh, uh, detailing how our liquidity follow uh, to compare again set limit. And very important to care for the central line uh, using SFT, uh, non touch technique, and close IV system. Next, please. So, what is the first line treatment? Uh, I mean, here is the medication for, for this patient. Uh, uh, actually, it's quite different from trust to other. Uh, and here we have to follow uh, our local guideline and every doctor to have to follow their own local guideline. In my hospital, we're using um, menocerebi tazosin, which is TDS actually initially, but also we can escalate it to QDS if clinically indicated. Uh, and there is no role for a routine use of manual glycoside uh, as far as line treatment, unless this specific local medic microbiology guideline to do so. So this uh, line has you seen EDS, you can create it to QDS. The same in my whole different level. <coughs> uh, next. Uh, for Brazilian allergic patient, um, we give ciprofloxacin, stickblanin, plus and my, or minus gentamicin. Gentamicin here we give only for a patient to severe sepsis or persistent hypotension to, to fluid challenge or fluid, IV fluid. Uh, and the line associated infection, uh, I said it's quite different to be treated. If you can see here, the line associated infection is treated with ticoblanin, plus gentamicin. In the usual patient with intravenous sepsis, we give tazosin. So we have to be a very uh, vigilant about if the patient got a line infection or not. So here we'll give a ticoblanin with gentamicin, and we have to consider removing the line and discuss with the microbiology. Uh, and all patients admitted with neutropenia, uh, neutropenic sepsis need to be reviewed daily uh, by full blood count, use and ease. Okay, next. Uh, Sometimes, uh, despite of giving antibiotics, the right antibiotic as a patient is just keeping spiking. So for patients with remain pyrexia, but are clinically stable, we have to continue the same first line antibiotic. And we have to take a blood culture when the patient is more than 38. And for patients who are pyrexia with a sign of hemodynamic unstable or a sign of cardiovascular instability, we have to consider additional uh, or second line antimicrobial and treat uh, I meant following discussion with the uh, microbiology. Uh, microbiology is quite uh, important. Doctor. Usually, contact them in case we are not certain about what kind of antibiotic we have to give. Uh, I, second line um, antibiotic and for patients with with uh, penicillin allergy, we usually give um, meropenem, which is one gram IV TDS. Uh, and uh, for patient, as I said, uh, who present with sepsis, uh, protected line infection, we have to give to and gentamicin and consider removing uh, the, the line. Next. Uh, and if patient remain uh, febrile after 96 hour, we have to consider an atypical opportunistic infection. We've seen a patient here admitted for a long time is uh, and it will be in sepsis. Um, so after four or five days um, of appropriate antibiotics, they're still spiking and the patient is really unwell. Uh, sometimes the cause here will be a viral infection, can be a fungal infection or a atypical organism like uh, pneumocystic uh, pneumonia. And we have to treat accordingly. And usually we consider empirical antifungal as a sign. Uh, and we have to think also about a multi-system organism. We have to review the blood culture in the system. We have to repeat the blood culture again. And uh, also we need to scan a patient with a CT scan or ultrasound. Sometimes maybe there's some collection in the body. 
So we have to think about all of this together if the patient is not responding to, to the initial management. Uh, when we have to stop the antibiotic, uh, so it's quite challenging when to stop antibiotic and when to discharge the patient. Uh, usually stop antibiotic if the patient is afebrile for more than uh, 48 hours, and then it refill counts more than uh, 0 0.5. And if the patient is culture is positive and the patient can be used appropriate antibiotic, and it remain an uh, afebrile for 48 hours. Um, um, I think this is the last slide, and hopefully it will be clear and summarized. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Dr. Ahmed, for this uh, very informative talk. Dr. Mahir, would you like to, Dr. Mahir, would you like to add any comment? No, I think it's very comprehensive and simple lecture. Uh, I have to say I have learned from it. Uh, there are a few things which, uh, obviously, most neutropathic sepsis patients in most hospitals in UK, uh, usually they get admitted to AAU. Uh, I don't know whether you, you agree with me or not, but, uh, and uh, obviously we, 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 need, we, we need really the support from the hematologists and oncologists in, in this matter, especially hematologists. But I think what, what you have done, I think you have done really, Ahmed have done a very good job here and just made it simple really to understand. And uh, I congratulate him for this lecture really. Well done. Thank you. I think I got just one question from the, the, from the delegate. Uh, they asking if the patient, uh, Yes, he had acute neutropenia, post chemo therapy, and the only symptom he had sore throat only. There is no fever, and he has have normal observation. Would you categorize this as neutropenic sepsis and start antibiotics? So actually, in this case, if the only as uh, if only a uh, sore throat or sore in the mouth, this chemotherapy itself can cause uh, soreness in the mouth. So uh, in this case, we are not treated as an intravenous sepsis uh, just by, by the symptom. Uh, we can treat this uh, sore in the mouse with appropriate uh, mouse wash. And here we are not treated as an intravenous sepsis unless uh, the patient is hemodynamically or the sign of sepsis, as I said, like tachycardia or hypothermia or fever. For this symptom only, we are not treated as, a, as an intravenous sepsis. Thank uh, you and very for, much. Dr. Mike Hamad said, yeah, the patient, uh, actually in my hospital, when the patient arrived to A&E and uh, uh, they call us to take over uh, their care. So we went down to admit uh, the patient directly to our ward. Uh, we've got a very dedicated uh, hematology and oncology ward. Uh, it's 28 bed and it's only for an HIV patient. Excellent. Thank you. I think I got two questions for one for Dr. Montasir. And I think I ask Dr. Montasir, would you I like to mute your microphone? And also, I think Dr. Nasreen, she had a question after my, my, my this yeah. one. The, the question from the, uh, sorry, Dr. Nasreen, your question might be related to Dr. Ahmad. Do you want to go ahead? Uh, um, yes, it's a matter of a question and a comment at the same time. Uh, yes, uh, mm. uh, thank you very much, Dr. Rahmat, for your very comprehensive lecture. Uh, actually, from our practice uh, in general medicine and as a cardiologist, I realized that um, uh, there is a scenario that is chemical to neutropenic sepsis, but is, is not neutropenic when the patient has any organ uh, problem, uh, such as when the patient has a heart problem or a chronic renal problem or a chronic chest problem then uh, the patient uh, behaves differently for even simple infections. Uh, what I realized that uh, early on the patient presents with symptoms and signs of organ dysfunction before the symptoms of sepsis appear. So if the patient, example, has a heart problem and he's um, a case of stable chronic heart failure or a patient of stable uh, chronic artery disease or uh, stable arrhythmia or whatever, then the patient presents first with symptoms of precipitating of the underlying cause, that is precipitation of heart failure or precipitation of pass AF or uh, precipitation of chest pain. Uh, that means um, uh, uh, the main organ that is affected um, behaves before, uh, before uh, the symptoms and signs of sepsis appear. And then later, the patient has this fever or uh, high-grade fever or even... Uh, oh, yeah. his, um, uh, 
Yes. So uh, what I realized that you have to act in the same way as neutrophilic sepsis. You have to act promptly, uh, quickly, and you have to have a high degree of anticipation. And really, we rely more on the history uh, taking and on the examination before the signs and symptoms of the uh, before the lab results. So whenever you act rapidly and you take a good history and then you you notice where uh, uh, the possible origin of uh, infection coming from. And then the same way you need to act with strong antibiotics. When, when we deal with simple antibiotics or moderate antibiotics, you have a worse outcome. So it, it needs um, quick attention and quick, uh, quick and strong uh, intervention so that you can bring up your patient uh, quickly and better, with a better prognosis. So do you agree with me from your practice as what I said? Uh, yeah, actually, I, I totally agree with you, and you highlight a very good point. Uh, actually, I think it depends on the system, um, the health system itself. Here, uh, we use a, a new score to find out if this patient is septic. So, for example, if you are NE and uh, you've got a new score more than four, so in this case, every patient uh, is it nitrobenic or not, we have to treat them as a sepsis anti otherwise, because it's quite a treat treated condition. And if sebation, for example, just tachycardic and a bit uh, uh, tachypneic, scoring four, in this case, they will treat as an intrabenic sepsis and with the consideration of other causes. So yeah, it's quite difficult at that time beginning to treat this kind of patient. But I think if there is a clear plan to treat a patient, if uh, the symptoms um, appear like tachycardia, hypotension, and if we can use uh, this new score, is quite helpful. It can uh, delete a lot of patients, which is difficult to be recognized initially. Thank you. I think the question now to Dr. Montasir uh, from the <coughs> delegate. Patient with COVID-19 also at risk of coagulopathy and bleeding risk. How can we reject the bleeding while we're treating pulmonary embolism? Yes, I think uh, this is I think this is even mentioned in the British Rosic Society statement. And I think uh, they did mention that also, especially when you don't have a solid diagnosis of pulmonary embolism or DBT, you have to assess bleeding risk. And I think there is a scoring system for bleeding risk. I did not bring it in in my lecture, but the scoring system for bleeding risk. Mm -hmm. And you have to get, uh, to weigh benefit against risk. And if there's a bleeding risk and you don't, and you are still suspecting PE, but you haven't got a solid diagnosis of PE, you have to, to, to balance the two. And you, have, of course, this is you be each case will be you the decision will be made in the individual case. But I agree with you, the risk of bleeding is there, and you uh, and but also the risk of PE is there, and both of them can be fatal. So you have to weigh, weigh risk against benefit, and it, it will be uh, it, it is it's better to do what you call. The scoring system for bleeding. I think there is a scoring system for bleeding, which I did not bring it in my lecture. Thank you very much, Dr. Montasef. Thanks. Yes. I think there's a question uh, for Dr. Mahir also with regard to uh, low molecular weight heparin and patient might going to develop DIC in COVID era. But before that, I think if Dr. Nasreen and Dr. Hind agree with me, that the question also from the delegate, they ask in what is the role of anticoagulation for patient with heart failure with reduced ejection fraction? in COVID-19 era. So they mentioned question like this. So I think for a patient at uh, just only pure heart failure, anticoagulation not indicated unless the patient had other comorbidities or other indication. Do you want to add anything, Dr. Nasreen or Dr. Hint? Uh, yes, I agree with you, but uh, pure heart failure is not an indication for anticoagulation. But uh, regarding COVID, uh, as uh, the, the new postulation that COVID is associated with uh, thrombo or microembolism, if there is a possibility of this or a feature of thrombo microembolism, then this is an indication itself for anticoagulation, but not heart failure per se. Thank you. And do you want to add anything? Uh, I think here, yeah, according to this a recent uh, uh, guideline published about uh, using a D dimer for stratification of the patient if they are at high risk of uh, microthrombi or whatever pulmonary embolism. So 
if according to my knowledge if the d dimer is the safety limit i think it is less than three or more than three if it is less we have to give uh, the usual uh, prophylaxis like uh, kilixin or uh, 40 milligram per day but if it is more we have to double this dose to, to bd and they found as all of you know there's a high risk of uh, microthrombine this patient and uh, if the D-dimer is high, we have to increase the dose of anticoagulation to try to prevent this complication. And? Yeah, I think I agree. Um, if the patient has uh, um, heart failure uh, with reduced ejection fraction, per se, without any other indications such as uh, atrial fibrillation, atrial flutter, or evidence of uh, LV thrombus, or any other indication for anticoagulation, just uh, heart failure per se, uh, is not uh, an indication for uh, anticoagulation or long-term anticoagulation, unless there is any other reason. Thank you. Dr. Mahid, uh, would you like to comment about this uh, low molecular weight heparin in patient, uh, Dr. Ahmed point that there is a very high risk patient, high D-dimer, and they might need anticoagulation, but at the same time, COVID patient, they can develop DIC. So the, the difficulty here, how to relate this, any comment? Uh, right. I, I think there is no robust evidence about any of those who are still learning, but the increase in the D dimer in, in COVID 19, or it is really a prognostic rather than a, uh, it's a bad prognostic science, really. When you've got high D dimer, high trop I, high uh, BMP, all of this, it doesn't, it doesn't mean uh, it, it just uh, point toward. Uh, poor prognostic uh, or outcome, really. Uh, at the moment, what we are doing, we're, we're, we're very uh, conservative here. So we, in and I don't know about ITU. ITU maybe they have gone to, to BD, but normally it is, the, the main thing is just uh, weight adjusted uh, uh given, uh, given an eye on the, on the, if the patient deteriorates, usually they go straight for CT scan or they, they, they are not improving. Like the saturation stay very low in, in the spite of CPAP and uh, CPAP. Uh, obviously, if they do well and they go home, they have prolonged some prophylaxis. Uh, edge adjusted d dimer is very important here. Uh, the, whether you give, uh, the, I, I, I don't think we have a clear cut about uh, what Ahmed said about whether the d dimer is higher than three or lower than three and what, what doses we give, but uh, obviously uh, each trust now has their own uh, 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 okay, uh, guidelines. And the important thing, I, I advise everybody, I advise everybody to, there's a webinar I will send it to you. I will send the link to you, Abdullah. My webinar done uh, for Imperial College, uh, uh, Professor Pierce from the Imperial College about uh, uh, the the uh, about the, uh, about the coagulopathy in COVID nineteen, which I found it very helpful as well. So I, I, I will send you the link and advise everybody to 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 watch that one. I just Thank want you. to. I, I guess I want to ask something here. This is actually a dilemma. Yeah. Regardless whether the patient has COVID nineteen or not COVID nineteen, we are being faced before with patient with pulmonary emphysema and also there is risk of bleeding. Yes. And one of the things we do is to involve the hematologist. And in actual fact, the British Thoracic Society statement they suggest that you you get the hematologist also involved here. It is a very difficult question to answer because you have to weigh risk against benefit and to see which one which is likely to um, affect the patient more and lead to his demise. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Montasser. That's really a right comment. So if do you, anyone had, do you have any comment, Dr. Hen, Dr. Ahmed, Dr. Nasreen, Dr. Mahir? I think we have got the last minute now in our... No, thank you. Thank you. I think and thank you for organizing. Thank, all you. thank you. Excellent thank you, work, Dr. Mahir. Excellent and thank you well. very much, Dr. Montasir. Uh, and you. we thank really, you. really appreciate it. Thank 
Thank you. Big thanks to our boss and Dr. Mahir Hamad. He he's he's doing this for ages and ages. Thank you, thank you very much, Dr. Mahir. Really thanks, Dr. Nasreen, for joining us today. And I'm really pleased for you, Dr. Ahmed. Thank you very much. Many thanks, Dr. Hin, and I hope to see you again in our coming webinar. Thank you very much. Yeah, thank, thank, you. thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thanks a lot.